this is beyond perception where it's all about breaking out of a limited understanding a limited perception of life and waking up to our human nature our true self and to our connectedness with all life i'm simon rilling and my guest today is nathan martin he co-created an integrative methodology called the unity process which combines the philosophy of natural law the trivial method socratic questioning jungian shadow work and meridian tapping into an easy to use system that allows people to process their emotional upsets work through trauma correct poor thinking discover meaning set healthy boundaries refine their viewpoints and maybe even the most importantly to achieve a positive focus so it's a true honor uh, to have you here nathan welcome it's great to be here thank you thank you yeah we we had a conversation before a couple of days before and um you shared already a little bit about um what you're doing and your journey and um in my personal journey, hearing and learning about the trivium, which I mentioned in the introduction, is something you're teaching and you are or have been integrating in your life. And personally, um, yeah, the, the finding the trivium and starting to learn to think for myself. And I was uh, at the age of 36 at that time. Um, yeah, it, it literally changed the way of um, like thinking. And it really was very important, it enabled me to understand um so much more about myself but also the world and and it also led me to you know start claiming sovereignty about how i actually want to live and um, also to find more meaning and that's yeah that's basically that's especially why i'm so thrilled uh to have you here as a guest today and and yeah to, to listen to you educating us sharing your wisdom with us uh, and um from what we've been um, uh, discussing a few days ago um, around the theme of the trivium, what that is and why it's relevant and empathetic reasoning. And yeah, before, before we start talking about or get, going into what that exactly is and why it's so eye-opening and um, really re relevant for each one of us, I would love to uh, hear a little bit more about uh, your journey and also how you how you discovered the trivium and um, also how and why you came up with um, yeah the, the unity process you developed. Okay, well, I uh, I guess it goes back to my childhood. I was uh, raised a Christian and I would read the Bible. Um, grew up in America, reading the Bible, and I really got hung up on the Book of Proverbs. And I would read it a lot and I would pray to God to make me as wise and give me the wisdom of Solomon. And so that was, that was my focus. That was what, as a child, um, I was focused on besides sports and, you know, normal childhood things. Uh, when I would read the Bible, um, my focus was on Solomon in the book of Proverbs specifically. Uh, so he was my hero growing up, I guess you could say. And that focus um, really kind of went into my life as I was a, uh, uh, I joined the Air Force and um, I troubleshot jets, fighter jets, F-16s. Um, I had this, this insatiable desire to understand why, uh, not just why things work, but why things, you know, why would people say things and do things? And it didn't really line up with how I was in the military because, you know, in the military, you just shut up in color. You know, you, I give you an order, you don't ask why. So my, my propensity for asking why questions to understand things um, really caused me problems while in the military. But at the same time, the military was a really good experience for me because um, I got to learn how to troubleshoot. I would troubleshoot jets when they would have a problem. You know, if they would have a, a technical problem, an electrical problem, whatever, I would troubleshoot that. And I could figure out what the problem is through this troubleshooting process. That later led me to um, becoming an IT uh, systems administrator and working on computers and networks and troubleshooting those. And um, also I learned, <laughs> I kind of did it the easy way. I didn't necessarily go to school for that. I, I went to Google for that. And I learned how to ask really good questions uh, when I had a problem and I could just find everybody else's solution to it in a 10th of the time 
uh, and solve the problem in a tenth of the time that everybody else would try to solve it because they're just trying to lean on their schooling and everything that they, you know, memorize. Mm -hmm. While I'm just going to Google and getting the answer. <laughs> so I, I learned to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you can ask the right question, you can get the solution a lot faster. So in, in that sense, I was, again, troubleshooting. So I troubleshot jets, then I troubleshot computers and networks. And then I started troubleshooting me. I started, started troubleshooting my own problems and the, the issues that I had in my, my life because I went through a really painful experience with a divorce uh, 20 years ago. And that divorce humbled me through humiliation. And it got me to ask questions of myself and to start researching what went wrong. And I asked myself a lot of questions and I started working through my thoughts, feelings, behaviors. Um, we're going to get to that here in a little bit. The thoughts, feelings, and behaviors concept is actually connected to the trivium. Uh, so yeah, I started just troubleshooting myself, asking myself questions. What, what is the problem? What's, what's going on with me? Um, I have a slide actually that I'm going to talk about with Mike Tyson, where he did the same thing. Mm -hmm. The famous boxer, Mike Tyson, mm -hmm. has some sagely words of wisdom. <laughs> mm -hmm. Should I put that one up? Uh, yeah, well, sure. You can put it up right now if you'd like. Okay, let me... Let me just share the one. Yeah, here you can see it there. <clears throat> okay. So in this slide, we see uh, that Mike Tyson actually is giving some advice to Conor McGregor when he went through some of his legal problems, uh, like last year or a year or two ago. And uh, Mike Tyson said, Conor has to look inside himself and say this, what happened? So he starts with a what question, what's going on, what happened? And you're going to get some where, some who, some when along with that. And then why am I the way I am? What, what, what formed me? What was this uh, underlying um, causes, you know, from childhood, et cetera? Why did I act this way? Why am I this way? And then how do I stop this from continuing to be? Then he ends with a how, which is wisdom. So it, it's interesting that he, right there, in specific order of the trivium, goes what, why, how, and asks the questions in the systematic fashion of the, the trivium for understanding the self. So a lot of people use a trivium out there. They use it for you know learning a, a skill, learning a trade, uh, you know learning what's going on in the world. Um, but they're they're not necessarily using it on themselves. But what I did is I my whole process, my whole journey was about asking myself these questions to start. I was I learned how to troubleshoot, and then I started using that process on myself. I started troubleshooting myself. And from troubleshooting myself, then I started working with clients and troubleshooting them. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and th that was, so, so that was something you discovered by yourself, which is, you could you'd say like something at some point, maybe natural process or a humane process to, to, to like, or, or is it that you, you've been introduced to the trivium or like? No, you know, I, I came in with a big why. Um, I, I had, when I was born, you know, why was a big fundamental question that I would ask. Um, not everybody comes in asking why questions like that. Uh, I'm not going to say that I was a little scholar or, you know, working the trivium as a child. I wasn't. Um, I went to school like everybody else. I got indoctrinated like everybody else. Um, but I still had like this heartbeat, you know, the pulse was still there for the trivium inside me like a seed. Uh, I, you know, maybe from a past life or if you, you know, that kind of thing, if you believe in that kind of thing, um, whatever the explanation was, I had a certain level of why when I came here, you know, when I was incarnate, when I was born and I kept that why even through times like in the military where they would try to shame it out of me. Um, companies don't like people with a why either. Uh, I was a Christian and they definitely didn't like me asking why questions. I was an equal opportunity why asker. I'd ask everybody why. What's going on here? Why is this? This seems like a contradiction. Because contradictions aren't natural. Contradictions aren't found in nature. So they are either an error or a lie. 
that's the two possibilities for a contradiction, an error. You know, you don't have all the information. There's something you don't understand yet, or somebody's lying to you, straight up lying. And so if there's a contradiction and you find it in church, they would, you know, say I wasn't teachable and no. uh, I'm just stubborn and, you know, I was going to go to hell, that kind of thing. But, you know, I, I just wanted the truth. It was to me, it was about the truth and I wanted to understand the truth. And I would ask a lot of questions to try to understand these contradictions, not to be argumentative, but to understand. And they couldn't see the difference. They couldn't see the difference between being argumentative and wanting to understand. So like Socrates, you'd go around asking questions all the time. That's what I did. Yeah, I, I, it makes, um, look, I mean, looking at my own journey and also uh, looking at what's happening in this world, yeah, it, it, it is not something we're really educated in to ask questions. Like When mm -hmm. I look at my own education, it was really about being you know, kind of like fed with information. Yeah? Like mm -hmm. It was about repeating that information, be good in school, like achieve a certain degree or diploma test result. But... Yeah, I, I really, um, yeah, I, I would say I lost my creativity <laughs> during those years and just maybe over the course of the last one, two years, it was like rediscovering it and that that, that is something uh, like part of the human experience and, and, and also reflecting on my education, understand why I was thinking the way I was thinking. No, it, it, like for me, it was so helpful to understand that uh, I was at that time like, thinking the way I did because I've been introduced to a certain way of thinking uh, or not thinking or where it's just really absorbing information and repeating it uh, to some extent. Right. And uh, that's a, a bit where I personally come from. And, and yeah, the questioning authority that that was not something we did in school. It was right, right. Exactly. Now I, I will uh, say that I ask my children questions all the time too. So mm -hmm. when they were growing up, And they would have a problem. I didn't solve their problems for them. They would come to me with a problem. I go, oh, well, what's going on? Tell me about it. So I'd start with a what? Well, why is it happening? And then well, how, what are you going to do about it? Which is the how. So I would go, what, why, how there too. Um, naturally. Um, you know, what's the problem? What are you having? What have you tried? Why, why do you think you're having this problem? And then how are you going to fix it? And I would let them answer those, those questions. And I would engineer situations for them where they would have to be responsible. And when they would have a problem with that, you know, like say they didn't do their laundry, uh, you know, and then they had the laundry that day, I, they would come to me, dad, I don't have laundry. Instead of solving the problem, I'd be like, oh, what are you going to do? <laughs> 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 Why did this happen? You know, I would just ask them a bunch of questions and let them solve those questions. And they're both extremely successful. They're 21 and 22 years old. And they're more successful than most, you know, 30 something, 40 somethings already in their tw early 20s. And that's because I put them ahead of the, the curve by asking them a lot of questions. And incidentally, they're both high school dropouts, which I'm proud of mm -hmm. because uh, I don't have a college degree. I do have high school. Um, I, I actually, I do have a two year degree because I just took tests and tested out of my degree <laughs> so, <laughs> in the military. But besides that, um, I, I didn't go to college. And also my children were high school dropouts at the age of 16, both of them. And for both of them, it ended up working out well, and they were a lot more responsible than their peers, a lot more grounded, a lot more capable. But that's because I asked them a lot of questions, and I was constantly letting them solve their own problems for themselves. It, it seems, yeah, also to lead to autonomy, or to, to like, because you're not, I mean, when I listen to what you share about how, like, raising or uh, educating your children, it seems that you're giving them, the, first of all, the, the responsibility. Mm -hmm. So they have to come up with a solution, but then also I assume that leads into a positive uh, feedback loop because when you then discover that you're able to yes. find the solution and uh, fix the situation and you did it and not someone else did it for you, that. Uh, I imagine that um, is really empowering uh, right. because that's something you can apply in all areas of, of, of um, life. It's, it's not that you're learning a technique or a, a skill which is, uh, which is useful in a niche, but, but that seems right. to be something which is uh, almost universal. Right. As, as a, 
a 17 and 18 year old, my daughter would go around her small town, her city, uh, what we call village here in Europe. And uh, she was getting offered jobs all the time. Like people just constantly offering her jobs because she's so much uh, more responsible than her peers and so much more um, grounded and capable. Just, just because of the incessant question asking that I did with, when they were younger. Hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it, it's super, super interesting. And, um, and it, it, so then, um, yeah, so I have a little bit of context, but when we speak about the trivium, so that this is really about asking better questions or like asking better questions, um, using a, def a definitive pattern. Um, I have learned a lot about the trivium since I was actively parenting them. Um, I still actively parent them, but I, I haven't actually officially trained them in the trivium. So it was just through, you know, doing Socratic dialogue, asking questions. Uh, so let it, me just jump. What is Socratic dialogue? Socratic dialogue oh. is a, a, a type of questioning that is done from a space of humility, where you don't necessarily know the answer and you want to know other people's viewpoint. And you ask it systematically, listening to the answers and then asking more questions. And you keep asking questions until you get to, uh, you know, uncovering assumptions, biases, um, thought patterns, problems, whatever it is that you're, you're looking for, um, you're dissecting thought with Socratic dialogue. And Socratic dialogue was obviously created by Socrates. He was the master of that type of questioning. Um, and he could systematically ask questions. So I've actually combined asking, uh, so doing Socratic dialogue with the trivium. Um, but I did Socratic dialogue with my children, not realizing what it was at the time and obviously getting a lot better at it um, the last 10 years or so. Uh, but starting off asking those kinds of questions when my children were young is what got me in the pattern, got me trained in it. And I, I actually started learning this from a book called Love and Logic, Parenting with Love and Logic. Um, they don't necessarily go by the trivium. They kind of miss the why part. Uh, but I was still asking some why questions because that was within me. And uh, it's super interesting. And from what I'm now listening, it seems to be a, um, a way of questioning where, um, where it's not proving something or, or um, um, following in, like proving your intention or your um, agenda, right. but it's an open questioning and you might also discover that you're wrong or is it? Yes, yes, of course. Um, now, you can you go out of the equation? I, I can use Socratic dialogue to lead students in a certain direction mm -hmm. um, or to lead a, a client, you know, in a, a like a, a therapy type session client session I do what's called philosophy sessions I'm not a therapist but I guess you could say it's like that um but no, for the most part I don't uh for the most part I don't want to lead them unless I'm I'm asking them questions about terms like what is the difference between this term and this term so they're they're like a pair of opposites so it's a binary one of the things that Marxism hates is binaries they're like you know let's get rid of the you know masculine feminine binary well, I'm finding these two opposites and then I'm asking the difference between the two, or I'm finding like two opposites such as dominance and control. And I'll say, what is the difference between dominance and control? I know the difference, but my clients don't necessarily know the difference. So I ask them and then we go into a discussion and I do a Socratic dialogue leading them to a, a better understanding of the difference between dominance and control where dominance is natural and control is unnatural. So I can, I can use Socratic dialogue to lead in those situations. But when it comes to their, their childhood, their experience, some of their viewpoints, I have no idea. I, I didn't live their childhood. I, I'm not there with them growing up, you know, every step of the way I wasn't, you know, even if I was their best friend, I still wouldn't be in their family. I still wouldn't be in the household every freaking day going through their experiences. So I can't know. So what do I do? I ask open-ended questions so I can know, so I can understand. And so you're using this tool or this is mm -hmm. so Socratic uh, questioning, is it? Mm -hmm. um, as a means to to um, establish the trivium or to to um, um, well, yeah, I've combined. Yeah, 
I, I'm asking the what questions. I'm, I'm asking all different sets of questions in a systematic way. And then if I find contradictions, because contradictions are not natural, they're not found in nature, they're either error or a lie, then we're going to work through those contradictions so that we can correct the error in thinking. And when we're th correcting the error in thinking, it's usually correcting a thought pattern. You know, this is this thought pattern is no longer serving us. It's not, maybe it was a, a defense mechanism or something like that, an avoidance mechanism to stay safe. We're going to have to work through that, under uncover some root core assumptions, um, some meaning that might not have uh, been good. So for example, a child will experience their parents' behaviors as God. And so when God says something to you as a child and you take it on as personal, because you can't, you don't have the boundaries, you don't have the individuality yet. And what it, what you take it on to mean isn't necessarily the truth. So for example, there's an experience, I, I had a client once that was uh, left at karate class or something like that. Uh, and everybody else left and she was sitting outside. Well, what happened was his mom got stuck in a traffic jam, couldn't get there on time. Well, little child to her, it means my mom's rejecting me and abandoning me. Mom is just stuck in a you know, it's not personal. She's stuck mm. in a traffic jam and this is before cell phones. Mm. So she can't call and let her know. So what the child thinks it means and what it actually means are two different things. And so sometimes we don't know like this fear of rejection later in life, this fear of being abandoned later in life comes from this simple little experience where mom got stuck in a traffic jam and the child felt uh, abandoned. And so we have to uh, reverse that meaning Un, you know, to, to remove that meaning and, and replace it with new meaning on a more of a subconscious level. That, that, that seems to me, um, yeah, kind of a step further than just affirming something. <laughs> yeah. Like, mm -hmm. uh, like everybody loves me, but, but here it seems that you're discovering what, what's the actual thought pattern belief and by understanding where it comes from, um, uh, it seems that it creates um, like a complete different dynamic than, than not being aware of what, what, what's the underlying root of um, this pattern um, and, and just compensating or like putting a, 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 a band aid above by, by saying that like, oh, yeah, you're going down deep. You're, you're going deep mm -hmm. to root causes. You're looking at causality. Now you're, you're deep into the logic of it and you're deep into the understanding of it and the process. And, and really, you have to take what, what's given to you in the moment, because life is a process. It's a journey. Everybody's like, you know, life is a journey. Enjoy the journey. Well, what does that mean, really? Mm -hmm. Well, it actually means that life is a process and that you have to take each step as it comes in its place in front of you. So if you have a feeling of abandonment right now because your boyfriend or your girlfriend is, you know, not here on time and you have this anxiety about that that's the next step to look at. And then you might find that it goes back to this harmless little incident as a child where mom got stuck in a traffic jam and could was 10 minutes late, you know? And, uh, but you're, you're looking at what happened right now, the feeling that you're going through in this moment, the pro, you know, you're actually having a logo centric focus. You're focusing on meaning and also on the, um, the process itself, the, the logic of life, the process of life. So as you're in this process, the next step is I feel this anxiety about being abandoned. Now I have to examine and reflect on this and where did it come from? And now you go back and you reverse engineer that and you fix that. Maybe that wasn't what my mom intended. Maybe it doesn't mean I should, I'm getting abandoned. And what's going to happen is just now this feeling in this moment is going to go away because you connected the, the feeling in the moment to a root cause. And would you say that we, it's a generalization, uh, we have a lot of contradictions going on in our um, unconscious mind or, or, or how would you describe it? Contradictions, that? yes. And also um, just limiting beliefs, you know, like less than, uh, we just don't, we're not conscious. We don't know the roots of it. We don't understand the roots. We don't understand ourselves. I'm feeling this. Well, why am I this way? Because I am. Hmm. you know because i was born this way because i had a bad childhood well but what what exactly in this moment is linked to where and once you can find the root cause now you have understanding and you have understanding in your own life you're conscious of why 
you behave as you do. And once you become conscious of why you behave as you do, you can now change that. You, can, you can't change that which you're not conscious of. So becoming conscious is you're becoming conscious of yourself, of why you think the way you think, the way you act, uh, the way you feel the way you feel, and the way you behave the way you behave. That's what you're becoming conscious of. That's being conscious. If you don't know why you think what you think, uh, feel what you feel and behave as you do, you're not conscious. Mm, makes makes a lot of sense. And um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, for, for me personally, like on my own, my own, yeah, on my own journey, um, it has been very recent that uh, I was introduced to that. It like there's a there's a there's a reason for everything. <laughs> there's a causality. For, for, for me, that was not obvious because no one ever told me about it. Yeah, so so for me, it seemed life seemed a bit confusing, <laughs> not not like the the most happiest like happy place, or like it, it didn't make so much sense. Yeah, that seemed very random, and I was in a, really in a state of confusion, confusion, and um, also having no clue why I felt that way or not, and and what to do about it. So it was really being. Um, yeah, almost, almost ob obsessed by trying to fix something or fixing it. Yeah, by by in, in my example, achieving more. That was my 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 mode, or what I thought would would give me the solution. Um, but uh, my discovery right. was act, 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 act. You're just in the how, you go in the what to the how, what how, what how, and that's really where most of society is. Is there in what how, what how? They have no why. They they jump over the why. They jump over the logic. They jump under. They jump over or beyond understanding. And so we're gonna we're gonna get to some slides when we actually mm -hmm. start the premium discussion. And we're gonna go through that. Yeah, I, I, for me with uh, with pleasure. Yeah, I, I, feel, I mean we talked now a little bit about the trivium. So um, yeah, might as well. You want to get started? Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. Okay, so yeah. if you can throw up the first slide. Yeah, absolutely. We'll put it up. So here it is. So uh, the trivium, it, it's uh, the first three of the seven liberal arts. So you have grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Grammar is, you know, where you get into uh, the words, the meaning of words, the etymology of the words, and then also the organization of those words into sentences. The logic is uh, you're you're getting into you know the logic of things, understanding these things. Uh, you can have one-dimensional logic, you can have multi-dimensional logic, um, and there's lots of different forms of logic. There's inductive reasoning, there's deductive reasoning, and there's abductive reasoning. And abductive reasoning is actually a very much overlooked form of logic that has turned into my biggest form of logic. It's the Sherlock Holmes detective form of logic. Where you're making observations and uh, working through um, and playing the detective, you know, doing the troubleshooting. And lastly, we have rhetoric, and rhetoric is uh, where you are doing the the presentation. You're you're use, it's the art of persuasion. Um, it's the ability to persuade. And you're going to have uh, ethos, pathos, and logos when you're using your rhetoric to persuade people. And we'll go into that in another slide. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So these actually correspond to different things. So grammar, if you're looking at the types of questions that you would be asking, if you're working it in a systematic type fashion, you're, you're getting knowledge. Uh, you're getting knowledge of the word structure. You know, like what, what does this word actually mean? Like, so let's use the word anarchy. Anarchy is uh, you've got without uh, and then Arcos rulers. So um, without rulers is the etymology of anarchy, where most people try to make uh, that um, to be uh, chaos. And it doesn't mean chaos whatsoever. And it also doesn't mean without laws or without rules. It just means that you are actually self-governing and you are you have those rules within you rather than outside of you. So if you if you are a law unto yourself, like Jesus taught within yourself, if you follow natural law and you have integrated natural law, then you're not going to need external rulers. So that is a way of using grammar in the knowledge phase. Now, they manipulate grammar with what's called gram uh, grammatical fallacies, and we'll talk about that later. 
and that's how they can make you think things and you can have consistent logic with false grammar so false grammar would be anarchy being being chaos and without laws so an anarchist today is not a true anarchist an anarchist is a, a, a rebel a chaos causer somebody who's out there just you know causing all kinds of chaos and and destruction and, and rioting and looting and that kind of thing and that's not the etymology the grammar has been distorted that's not an anarchist hmm. um yeah that, that that's um that's also that <laughs> was over i was there with the last the last year was was first time I ever encountered the meaning yeah, <laughs> of words yeah? and, and uh, also being so surprised by what by using words without having a clue what they actually mean but then they they um, they might uh, imply something completely different uh, or mean something completely different than, than I believed they they mean yeah? and 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 um, and just like starting to look a bit into the meaning of words or their origin mm -hmm. uh, things started to make a, a, a quite a bit more sense yeah um, right another word is patriarchy the uh, that was a grammatical fallacy that was made by the catholic church um because actually pater is latin for father uh mm -hmm. but it's a greek word and if you go into the greek patria means family and arcos again means ruler so a patriarch is a family ruler, and it can be male or female. It is not gendered. And matriarch was something that was created later in like the 17th or 18th century to try to compensate for the Catholic Church's version. But it wasn't something that was actually a historical word back, you know, 2000 years ago. Patriarch was masculine or feminine. It was the person that led the family. It was the family leader. So again, we see another uh, possible grammatical fallacy that is skewed and now we have all these feminists that are attacking the patriarchy what are they really attacking the family hmm. they're not they're attacking men but through attacking men they're attacking the family they're destroying the family <laughs> so that's how a grammatical fallacy can be used that's how you know now but also uh we'll get more into those later hmm. yeah um then we have understanding and understanding is, uh, you know, you ask why questions to understand something. And understanding is also very much connected to empathy because both empathy and logic ask why questions. Why do you feel this way? That's empathy. You know, you're, you're, you're not judging and you're asking why instead because you really want to understand that person. You're using what's called empathetic reasoning. It is the emotional component of logic. Empathy is the emotional component of logic. It is not sympathy which most people confuse it with. Sympathy is where you are feeling bad for somebody because you yourself have experienced that. And understand uh, with empathy, you don't necessarily understand them because you weren't in their family. You haven't gone through the, what they've experienced. It's not striking a, a universal chord within you. And so now you're asking why questions to understand. And then lastly, we have wisdom, which is the right action. It's applying it's when you have the knowledge and the understanding and now you apply it, that's wisdom. And of course, I already said that these three different categories, when you take it as a, a mental pattern of asking questions, uh, the grammar and the knowledge represent the what, who, where, and when questions, logic and understanding represent why questions, and then the rhetoric and the wisdom represents how questions. Can you go to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, this pattern in life you can find in life. It's not just a. Uh, it's not just something that is the trivium. It's it's everywhere. So as I said, you have the grammar, logic, and rhetoric. You could call this the pre-rational phase, the rational phase, and the trans-rational phase. And both the pre-rational and the trans-rational might appear similarly to the outside person because there's no reason in it. Well, there, there's, it, they're both not uh, in a rational state. Uh, however, the transrational contains within it both the pre-rational and the rational. So each one transcends the other. So if you look at it like uh, pre-rational, then you transcend the pre-rational with rational, and now you transcend both of those with transrational. So within 
transrational is both the grammar and the logic. Within rhetoric is both grammar and logic. Within wisdom is knowledge and understanding. Within how questions should be the what and the why questions. So you cannot have any wisdom without mastering the other two steps. Right. You, ha you can't get to the how until you first have an adequate what and why. Now I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you can also say like for a computer, you have the input, you have your keyboard, mouse, floppy drives, that kind of thing. Uh, then you have your processor with a hard drive and that kind of thing. And then you have your output, which is your monitor and your speakers um, and your printer. So you're seeing the output from you know, that, that goes through the input and the processor. You know, you could have a, uh, <laughs> a monitor and uh, a printer, and it's, if it's not connected to a processor with input, nothing comes out. <laughs> You're not going to see anything, and you can't print anything. You, you need the, the full computer to do that. And Why is your computer? The processor is uh, the logic. And... Um, would, would you say that it makes sense to equate um, uh, wisdom uh, basically to, to like our experience of life? And if, if there's poor wisdom or there's not a lot of uh, knowledge and understanding, th there's a poor quality of life. And if there's uh, like whatever kind of suffering or not, that that's um, like a direct connection to this process. But maybe I'm, I'm yeah. jumping ahead. Yeah. No, it, no, it's true. Mm -hmm. Um, in life, we see that, you know, in child, you're pre-rational, you're not necessarily developing your rational yet, but it's the parent's job to uh, teach them reason, to ask them questions. This is what I did through my parenting when I would ask my children questions is I was actually giving them the ability to reason through asking them questions. So a, a child who goes through a parenting where the parents are always telling them what to do, they never develop their own understanding of why and they don't know how to reason for themselves. Therefore, they're always looking outside of themselves for a why. And that's the problem with most of society right now is they look outside of themselves for why. They don't go inside and trust their own process and thinking processes. They have to go outside and let somebody tell them what to do. What do I do, mom? What do I do, state? Hmm. What do I do, boss? And we're, we're going outside and then the boss tells us. The, 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 the master tells us. So it's a, a slave-like mentality to stay in the child state. But if the, if the parent has asked the, the child enough questions, they're going to move into adulthood. And once they've you know adequately developed their adulthood, now they're going to go into their you know uh, they're going to retire, and they're going to you know even retire early, because they are now in wisdom. They they've mastered the the child state of the knowledge and the um, the processing state and the, the logic state of the adult, and now they're living in wisdom. That's why a lot of the, uh, you know, the kings would have you know, these, the old wise men advising them because they, they were wise. They had a, a very good understanding of um, the knowledge and the understanding. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. If you look at mystery schools and uh, um, secret societies and stuff, you have three stages. You have the initiate stage, you have the, the adept stage where you're, now you have the master stage. If you're looking at it from Star Wars, it's like you got the <laughs> the uh, Padawan, the Jedi Knight, and the Jedi Master. Those are the three stages. The master has has mastered both the, the initiate stage of the pre-rational and the rational, and they're now living a trans-rational life. So if you look at it from uh, going to heaven, you know you have to invite Jesus in your heart. So you have humanity in the pre-rational stage. Uh, Jesus, the Logos, shows them the rational stage. He is the metaphor for uh, logic, the Logos, the divine word, the divine reason, empathy. And that is integrated into your heart. And now you can make it to the Father or heaven. Heaven representing wisdom. Jesus representing understanding. And then we, starting off as humans, is in the pre-rational state knowledge mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you look at the uh the stages of the divine marriage there's actually five stages but um there's three main stages and then two in between stages so you have the purgative stage which is stage one that is when you're a child you know god you're connected to god 
and uh, but God is apparent. Then you go through what's called divine or uh, the dark night of the senses where God withdraws from your senses and you have to uh, go through this stage until you come into enlightenment. So enlightenment is stage three. And in stage three, you're illuminated, you're enlightened, you are now in the process. This is why the European enlightenment is, is called what it was called. The European enlightenment and the, the, Brit the uh, English enlightenments are about the process. They are about logocentrism, focusing on the logos, on reason, the law of reason. And then you get to the fifth stage, or you, you go to the fourth stage, which is in between uh, in, enlightenment and the divine marriage, and that is the dark night of the soul. Now, God pulls away from your soul a little bit, and he plays hide and, hide and seek with you. And you have to do your shadow work. You have to look inwards. You have to take your enlightenment and go inside. So you're not just externally enlightened. Now you're taking it inside. And then at a certain point, you reach union with God. So God is no longer your father, such as the purgative stage. God is now your lover, and you experience marriage with God. So if God is a, a metaphor for your higher self in some circles, mm -hmm. you are merging the body, your, your egotistical body, your, your, your individual self with the divine. And now you, you have now married the divine. That is stage five. So, but in this, it, it would represent the transrational state. Mastery. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah many different perspectives yeah which yeah i mean it, it, it's you uh, can see the pattern all throughout mm -hmm. uh life experience mm -hmm. uh philosophies that emphasize the middle step of the cycle uh, are called logocentric such as empiricism rationalism stoicism christianity gnosticism and classical liberalism i'd also say that judaism is um focused on the logos and that's why the, the concept of Jesus came through the Jewish tradition uh, originally uh, because there was um, a there was a sense of shadow work which they call teshuva and uh, there was a sense of um, the divine logos uh, so it didn't necessarily um, just because they didn't accept it doesn't mean that they weren't actually logocentric in at least the seed. The seeds of logocentrism was definitely within Judaism. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, super interesting. Do you have any questions about any of that, by the way? Um, I, I have a few goof. Um, so far, like for, for these slides, not. Um, I, um, I have a few questions. Maybe they fit in later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so this is the one we uh, previously had before. Yeah, we can pass that one now. Yep. Okay, so there was a, a verse in the Bible. And uh, Jesus says, or he answers, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, to wisdom, except through me. So this is where I was kind of telling you that you have knowledge, logic, and wisdom or knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. The Logos represents Jesus. He's the divine reason. And you get into heaven by having him in your heart. The middle stage is the heart. If, if, you're, if knowledge represents your brain, understanding represents your heart, the lo uh, logic, Logos, represents the heart, and then wisdom represents your genital area. So you have to kind of go through these stages to get to wisdom. So if you're just, you know, if you're starting down in your, your genital area and you're trying to go up, going the wrong direction, you need to start. You, you can't start with your rhetoric. You have to start with your knowledge. One of the things you said before, they mani manipulate grammar. So um, that needs to be right. the, the, the first step. So if, if, and, uh, so if, if that's not accurate, that, that there's not really, um, like you cannot really like go on that journey because your starting point right. is not not accurate and right everywhere you go after that's going to be wrong and and also you know like um they call this the crucifixion of reason so that the reason that it's the cross is a lot of times reason gets crucified you you know jesus got crucified because the mob went after him. the mob mentality this thing that you're trying to individuate yourself from reason 
is what makes you an individual. And the person who breaks free from the mob is going to get attacked by the mob. Until which point the person, you know, accepts death and they accept that they no longer fit in with the mob. And then they can be born again into this new life where they are uh, now a sovereign, autonomous individual. So they have to die to this mob mentality. They have to get crucified by the mob in order to become an autonomous individual. Now that you're an autonomous individual, now you can go act in the world in a way that is very intentional and conscious. Hmm. It's also the metaphor of the mob going to, you know, Dracula's castle or Frankenstein's castle and killing the monster. Hmm. The monster really is the person who's become autonomous. He's individuated himself from this uh, collective mob mentality that's easily manipulated, easily controlled, the slave mentality. Uh, well, one question here. Um, one thing you know, you're referring to Jesus, and um, and and, and um, do you, do you speak in, in terms of metaphorically, or um, uh, what what like what would you say is is uh, like does it matter? Archetype. It's it's, it's a Arch metaphor. It's yeah. an archetype. Um, really, I'm not here. I'm not a scholar. I'm not here to say he existed mm -hmm. or didn't exist. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to say that you're not going to get to heaven into wisdom without him. You're not getting into it without integrating. And becoming autonomous, conscious. Why do I act this way? Why do I think this way? Why do I feel this way? You're not going to get there without a sense of autonomy. You can't get to wisdom without that autonomy. And the autonomy comes through becoming a reasonable human being. And I'm not talking about cold, calculated machine logic. Machine logic is not true logic because it's missing the emotional component. It's emotionally deficient. And that's psychopathy. You're going to be a psychopath if you don't have the logos integrated into your heart makes a lot of sense um before uh, yeah as, as just said you said they they manipulate grammar that I, i don't want to lead off topic and uh, but but for some people listening to this it might like who is manipulating anything like why is there manipulation or what's the manipulation and uh, i don't want to lead off topic here but um maybe just a brief comment or perspective on well that. there was a a saying We're actually going to get to that in a little bit. Oh, okay. Okay. But I, I will say that uh, Alexander the Great wrote a letter to um, Aristotle when he came out with his uh, book and treatise, Metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And he was like, what the hell, dude? <laughs> why, did you, <laughs> why did you let everybody know our game? You just gave everybody our, our secret knowledge and the things that makes me be a king over them. It's what gives me the ability to rule over them. So if it's what gives people the ability to rule over others, it also gives the ability to be sovereign in oneself. Uh, the mm -hmm. thing is, is nobody really understood metaphysics to the degree without integrating it. Because if you don't integrate it, it you can read it and not understand it. Mm -hmm. It's just knowledge. You still have to go through the process of philosophizing, of working it, doing the process, integrating the, lo the divine logic, the logos into your heart. And becoming sovereign and autonomous. So once you're autonomous, then you can lead a sovereign individual life. Or in the case of these kings, rule over people. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure Alexander the Great was uh, a psychopath of some sort or a narcissist too. So he wanted to use that as a way of having power over others. Yeah, well, the, the story I, I, I um, Mark Pazio shared when, when I first encountered Natural Law in the Trivium, he said that Julius Caesar spotted one of his generals sharing this Trivium with one of the slaves, yeah. and he, he was out of his mind, and he said, like, something along the lines, like, if I see you ever doing this again, like, you're done, <laughs> like, we will give you the, the dogs, yeah, uh, because it, yeah. That, that there was um, a recognition or that there was this awareness that, like, This is very powerful because you start understanding your condition and that, that it's not um, like not um, your natural uh, right. potential or state. Yeah, and, 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 and yeah a, a classical education to teach that to frees slaves. the mind. Mm -hmm. A classical and, education frees the mind. Uh, one of the things, if you talk about etym etymology, government, mm -hmm. that was one of the, the biggest one for me govern mm -hmm. yeah, govern the mind mind control that was like ah oh, really yeah <laughs> yeah okay but that was a bit off yeah awesome next slide please yes please yeah sure
So Dennis Prager, who is an Orthodox Jew, he said, I believe reason alone can bring us to God. And so he was acknowledging that logocentric core in Judaism that is also in Christianity, that understanding the reason in logos is how you get to truth to God. You can go to the next one, please. And here we come to the, the formula for truth. So the formula for truth is simple. It goes knowledge or information plus understanding, which is logic, minus contradictions. So you have to work through all the contradictions and that equals wisdom or truth. So you, you need the knowledge and the understanding. You work through all the contradictions. If you find them, you have to work through them. And a real easy way to find something is, you know, the news presents something to you. It seems contradictory. Boom. That's a, that's a, a dead giveaway that you're either being lied to or there's an error. And so now you have to work through the knowledge and the understanding until there's no more contradictions. And that's going to tell you what the real truth is. It seems like a very, very, um, uh, uh, it seems qu quite a bit of efforts. At first, yes. Yeah. Now, if you're trained like with this in, at childhood, it's no effort at all. <laughs> it's, um, you know, just to become second nature. You know, you go to uh, Sherlock Holmes and he's examining a crime scene and it looks like magic. How does he saying all these things? How is he noticing all these things? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not possible, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we can each become a detective in our own right for reality. I'm not talking the way of that he's doing it, but, you know, within ourselves, where we can go through this process of, uh, you know, taking the knowledge and understanding and removing all contradictions and coming to the truth fairly quickly. Um, and at the very least, you're going to come to something that's more true. But as uh, I can't remember the, the quote who said it, but, you know, it's and an educated mind is able to hold things as possible or probable mm. without saying it's truth or mm. not. Mm. You know, you can just keep it for consideration. Mm. And so I'm doing this all the time. I'm constantly just holding things for consideration and coming to more and more true as I, you know, as I grow in wisdom. Mm -hmm. So conversely, if you want to look at the formula for a lie, you're going to have partial distorted or hidden knowledge. Partial is, you know, they're only telling you a half truth. Distorted is they're confusing some ideas. They're, you know, doing some kind of a, uh, a fallacy when it comes to the grammar you know, like say with anarchy uh, or Nazi or something like that, or and then hidden knowledge. You know, there's knowledge that you're just not getting. Like for example, natural law, the seven laws of, of nature. You're not getting these knowledge, uh, this knowledge. Now you're gonna add some contradictions to this and subtract logic, understanding. And then if you're subtracting logic or understanding, it's either because you've, you've got really bad premises in your your grammar stage your knowledge uh, or there's some logical fallacies and that is the equation for folly that equals folly or lies mm. folly being um the opposite of wisdom you know it's a fool a fool is, is full, uh, full of folly you are frozen by the way on your video um Am I back? Oh, shit. Uh. Ah. Okay, you're back. <laughs> no idea what happened. Um. So, what are what do you think about the uh, the formula for all, the truth and the lie? That's pretty cool. What I was wondering when I listened to you, um, I was just thinking about the news or information we exposed to, and I was kind of internally estimating or um, what, what's the percentage of uh, partial distorted, uh, like uh, contradicting uh, information, uh, like from what we exposed to, yeah, uh, uh, leading oh, to God. leading to a society which, and, and that's my opinion, yeah. <laughs> Uh, like um, a mankind which is very suppressed in a state of fear and they're not really in a, in a position where um, they understand themselves or what, what's happening and, um, and what, what's your view or thought well on that? 
we're definitely post enlightenment, post modern, post truth. Um, you'll hear that you know we're we're going towards a, a post truth society. Post truth being truth no longer matters. I, I believe that there's a um, an attributed quote from a guy, um, a CIA director from 1980 where he said something like, you know, we'll know that our job is done when nobody knows what to believe anymore, that we've done a good job because they've just thrown out a lot of information and a lot of contradictory information. And they do that to make everybody confused. That's why self-knowledge is so important because that's not going to confuse you. You're going to be able to work through things. So if, you, if you're constantly looking at the outside world and just externalizing with your, your focus, you're not, you're going to go mad at this point in history because this point in history is post-truth and all the information that's out there is garbled, distorted, contradictory, fallacious, full of logical fallacies. It's just insane, but you can know yourself still. So you can redirect your knowledge and your understanding. You can, or your inquiry your questioning inside. And in fact, this is where it should have been all along. So society, this post-truth society is actually making it easier because you're gonna go mad if you just focus on the external world. You have to go inside now at this point. You're gonna to have to start asking yourself what and why questions so that you can finally get to right action. And that, white act, that right action is gonna be based on your own internal morals and compass and objectivity and truth. So that's the way that you're gonna know how to act in a world where everything outside of you is a lie. Makes a lot of sense. Um, and and um, what I just thought, uh, uh, for example, I, I, I mean, I've been in, in church and my, my family is Christian. So th there was some uh, moral concepts around that, but they didn't resonate with me. Um, external morality. External yeah, morality. But, but when I, when I last year, again, was introduced to disinformation uh it, it was natural law and morality and i was like oh wow yeah yeah it actually makes a lot of sense and oh i have rights yeah yeah inherent rights oh wow okay let me claim <laughs> them yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and i can claim them yeah really <laughs> yeah. yeah oh it's actually that simple yeah <laughs> i can claim uh, autonomy and sovereignty about uh, like uh, uh, um uh, um for, for for myself and how i want to be how i want to think and it's like that's possible yeah and, and yeah and and, and wow. it's a notion that objectivity mm -hmm. is is or morality is objective mm -hmm. and so there is an, an objective truth there is an objective morality and you can find that inside yourself and even ayn rand she came up with the, the philosophy of objectivism um and she straight up said that you know all morality is objective and it's reasonable and I mean, it, it, you just you just need to be able to integrate it into your own life. And once you can integrate it, now you're going to treat people right. You're going to treat people right because it, it's it's reasonable to do so. It, yeah, it, not cold machine logic. It's the empathetic logic, empathetic reasoning, which I I actually coined the term empathetic reasoning. Hmm. I, I think it's actually a form of reasoning that we can integrate, and I think it's perfectly represented by the logos. Yeah, I mean, yeah, those teachings or these information, they, they were pretty straightforward. They're like initially a bit difficult to, to grasp because it was like, didn't fit um, the worldview uh, most common, uh, maybe on mm -hmm. this planet. But then, uh, but then also understanding that everything has a has a cause. Huh? That that mm -hmm. like, where I am, how I think, how we are on this planet has a cause. It's not random. Huh? It, and and um, you mentioned about manipulation before um, but when you start understanding why the world is as it is it might at some point uh, be a little bit frustrating or <laughs> cause some anger or so but it's ultimately that's my personal realization it's very liberating be, be, because you understand it's it's oh that's the reason yeah? and as you said before mm -hmm. I, when i can understand why it is happening or, or what is happening and why it is happening I, I'm not subject to it anymore. Yeah? Even right, I'm because I'm creating it. I'm creating my reality through my focus. And I'm co-creating my reality through a joint focus. Mm. And so as I can change my focus, 
and be the most dominant fo with my focus is the most dominant in my circles. And then those who are around me start to submit to my dominance. And so now my focus, which is based in, uh, you know, a positive focus and natural law and being objectively moral and creating my reality in a way that um, stays in my own lane, respects others. Uh, and because I'm able to do that and I'm able to anchor into the logos, this, this primordial pattern, this, this uh, of understanding and logic, divine logic, divine reason, this uh, primary, uh, primordial archetype, you might call it. Um, I'm anchored to that. I've built my house on the rock, like Jesus said. You want to build your house on the rock so that when the, the storm comes, it's not going to knock it over. My personality is anchored to the logos. That is my foundation. And because that's my foundation, now I can do all kinds of things in my life. And in fact, dominate reality around me and dominate people around me, not control them. Can, can, you, can you can you elab elaborate <laughs> because I, I i can sense that dominating others that that um, kind of um, i hold it in my mind but it it's um okay a wolf a wolf pack yeah or a dog there is a an alpha and the alpha dominates now the thing about an alpha is the alpha has the most liability they're putting their ass on the line the most they have the most responsibility they have the most liability They're the one taking the most risk. They are also dominating. The thing with a controlling person is they get you to take the responsibility and liability, not them. A controlling person doesn't take responsibility. They don't put their ass on the line. They're not taking liability or accountability. They're making everybody else and pushing it off on everybody else around them. You have to take the responsibility, not me. So an alpha, a dominant alpha takes responsibility and they dominate and they're staying in their lane uh, and they're not controlling people. A controlling person leaves their lane, go into other people's lanes and they make people take responsibility for them. So they dominate, they, they control them into taking responsibility. So like royalty, modern day royalty or you know, through the last couple thousand years, they get everybody to take responsibility for them. You give money to me, you give things to me, you are doing all this stuff for me. I have the least amount of responsibility. You have the most. So it's an uh, alpha is it's reversed. So it's a domination or a dominance. Another word with a dis distorted. Uh, yes. A, a sense yes. to it. Yeah. Because it's yes. something like, oh, proper I want to dominate I'm others. Yeah. <laughs> Say again. I'm using proper grammar and meaning yeah. for these words. So these yeah, words yeah. have the correct meaning. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at nature, you, a dog is not controlling other dogs. You know, the, the, the head of a lion pride is not controlling the other animals. It's not a controlling being. It's natural. Mm. There has to be a natural version of dominance that mm. is not controlling. It's uh, super interesting just, just to think about it. Uh, because I, and that was some, something, um, maybe a similar context. So, for example, being angry. That was something like oh, I don't want to be angry. It's like it's, 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 it's not a good state, no. But but also understanding that um, like like some form of anger might be a very good thing actually because it uh, well, it's a feedback think, device. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes you stand up to something, yeah, and, and to re respond or not accept uh, uh, misbehavior or abuse being done to you. So it's but but I was at, at that time I was like oh no anger like we should get rid of the anger and um, and um, um, and then also thinking about yeah conditioning again yeah how how the like anger is twisted and uh, dominance that that <laughs> felt a bit different uh, uh, similar. Um, right. So the, I actually dominant, have a saying dominant, yeah. that mm -hmm. he who controls the premises controls reality. So uh, in deductive reasoning, you are if you take some premises like uh, you know Socrates is a man. All men are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. So that's the logic of those premises. So if you feed somebody false premises, the logic is going to be sound, but the premises are wrong. So if you change the grammar, the premises, then everything that comes after might be logical, but it's still wrong. Mm -hmm. Like the, the initial, like initially, if you have a small calculation error, but then like continue uh, calculating correctly, like it's still is flawed. Huh? Yeah. Right, exactly. Now your your telemetry is off, mm. or your you know the the foundation is off on the building. Now you're bringing you know building a, a building that's like this rather than the, you know straight. 
Yeah, and you might not even recognize it's it's like that. Yeah. <laughs> that was too late. Mm, yeah. Super interesting. Okay, so uh, next next slide. Yep. It was, I think, it was number seven, right? Yep. yep. Fair-minded thinking versus biased thinking. Super. Yeah. Okay, so in the top uh, bubbles, you have the fair-minded thinking. It's reasoning from evidence. So your evidence takes you to conclusions. Your evidence determines conclusions. So you have your evidence, knowledge, input, and grammar. You know, then you go to your reasoning, understanding, you process it into your logic. So you're processing all of your evidence. And then you come to conclusions and wisdom and output or rhetoric from that. However, most people, and this is actually what's being taught with argumentation and debate, are being given, uh, they have this pretentious knowing. They're, it's what's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. They just, they think they know because they're too stupid to know they don't know. Mm. And <laughs> this is actually being cultivated in society and in universities. They have this pretentious knowing. They have their emotional attachments. They're, they're attached to certain conclusions. They want these outcomes. Therefore, uh, it's very fallacious. There's a lot of folly there. And uh, the art of rhetoric is used by manipulators when they start from conclusions. So the art of rhetoric is different than rhetoric. The art of rhetoric is where you start from a conclusion and rhetoric is where you, you let the evidence determine the conclusion and you're persuading. Then you're going to, in biased thinking, you're now rationalizing. You're, you're creating reasons from your conclusion. And this is also called motivated reasoning where you are motivated to create reasons for something to support your desired outcomes. Manipulations, processes, logical fallacies. And I would say that um, when people say uh, in spiritual circles that you have an emotional attachment, this is what they're saying. You're attached to an outcome. You're not reasoning from evidence and going to a conclusion. You're reasoning from a conclusion. So an emotional attachment is another way of saying that in your emotional state, you have circular reasoning. And now you're going to come to false, uh, falsified evidence, manipulated statistics, biased premises, and altered grammatic, uh, grammar change meaning. So you're, you're going backwards. You're, you're, you're finding your rationalizations and you're changing things in order to fit your predetermined agendas. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's like true science would use the top side. You know, it goes from evidence, reasoning, to a conclusion, false science, um, you know, controlled science, bot science is, is reasoning from the end. Sorry for that. Well, that's right. We could stay on this slide. Yeah. Uh, one of the things, uh, uh, something re recently, uh, or I saw that video, I think yesterday or so, um, a, for, a for, former member of some German uh, uh, ministerial um, uh, uh, part, uh, he was explaining the process of, of how, how, uh, Mm. It is done. Yeah. So, so he said that the, the government comes uh, to the minister, uh, uh, says, "Okay, this is what we want. <laughs> yeah. Right. So this is our outcome. Now, um, organize, organize it." So the minister then goes to some uh, um, uh, science people yeah, and, and tells them, "I need a, I, I need a um, assessment." Uh, uh, Right now, I'm losing the word Gutachten, like uh, um, analyzation, yeah? like a document mm -hmm. which which um, I can refer to. Yeah, in, in mm -hmm. so so that seems to be exactly exactly this process yeah? where, where there's an outcome defined, yeah? a conclusion, and now um, they're then uh, manufacturing evidence, yeah, um, to mm -hmm. to support that uh, desired outcome, and that, that's something I can I can put it in the show notes because he described it <laughs> like in, in three minutes. Yeah? <laughs> what what <laughs> I can um how how does this how does this um how does this yeah that's that's basically is uh society has and, and, and sorry and that was that was um like just right now like uh lockdown and um, like um, justifying that yeah that that was the, the, right. the example that he shared that process of um yeah a, a lot of people are, are reasoning in this uh quote pandemic and i mm -hmm. use quote uh intentionally there they're reasoning from a conclusion in many 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 ways 
and they're they're not going from the beginning and going through reason and evidence to the outcomes they're they're starting from an outcome and going backwards mm -hmm. yeah, it's um once you know those concepts you can start to differentiate yeah but, but right otherwise it's it's um and, and once you really become ingrained in the process yeah. so knowing it is one thing but once it's integrated and you understand it so well because you've done it to your own thinking you've done it to your own feelings mm -hmm. and actions um you're just not going to get fooled by it anymore and you're going to be able to tell because your your feelings actually tell you there's a problem if you feel something you know something's off now you're going to have to look at and find what's off mm -hmm. so feelings aren't there to tell you what is uh what is true well, it, they do actually tell you what's true and false. Your feelings can tell you what's true and false, but it's it's mostly as a starting point. So I feel something like, ooh, that's off. And now I have to go through the process of, of working through the process in myself to understand why it's off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to deconstruct my limiting thinking, troubleshoot myself. And once then I'm gonna have better thinking. Now that I have better thinking, I'm even, less manipulatable mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I, I don't get triggered by nearly anything anymore i mean it, it's very few things trigger me because emotionally it's just i've processed my upsets every time i have an upset i process it i go back to childhood i go back to uh, thinking patterns i go back to societal thinking patterns i go back to um, my own fallacious logical fallacies and things like that and i, I deconstruct it and because I've deconstructed it and I, I got really good with my first partner doing it, or not my first partner, but my most recent partner, long-term partner, we became philosophers together and we just did nothing but trigger each other and then work through those triggers together using empathetic reasoning. Yeah, that, that, that's something I've been doing with my wife also for yeah. like one to year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's life changing. <laughs> once you, we, once we even you... had a central theme. We had a central theme that triggered each other up, up and down. You know, uh -huh. one side yeah. or the other, and yeah. and uh, it was our job to trigger each other, and um, it killed the romance, but it it made us like, excellent philosophers together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that that's, that was also. Um, so eye opening to understand that I'm not my thoughts. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I can analyze them and, and I can, right. um, I, and I, I can permit them to, I can permit to see them. Yeah. Because I'm just observing them. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with the thoughts and themselves or having thoughts. You know? like, and that, but right. I, I'm not ignoring them yeah? because, oh, no, like that, like that means something about me. Yeah. But it doesn't. Yeah. And then, uh, and then also, but then also in the other person, that example, my wife, you know, or, mm -hmm. like, her thoughts, her emotions, it, she's just experiencing them. So, so it doesn't mean something about her or also um, about me. You know, it's, it's right. just, and so it, 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 it just like starting to understand that um, help to, to, they call it not always, but to stand above it, yeah, to, to not be triggered so much and, and then be, right. be able to process it together. Yeah. Yeah, they, they call that the observer self. And once you develop your observer self, you're, you've pretty much um really hammered into the enlightenment phase the process because now you are really good at observing things you're observing others you're observing yourself you're constantly observing so you're the neutral observer you're the one watching you think and you're the one having the experiences and thinking so you're you're watching yourself have the feeling and you're experiencing the feeling and you're going through all of these different uh things as being the observer and the one experiencing so it's they call that the um, well, it's just the observer self, really. And that's how you can do shadow work. Shadow work is basically where you have mastered being an observer and are now consciously deconstructing all of your shadows, becoming conscious of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, um, it would be interesting to, un to to hear a little bit more about the actual process um, uh, you're doing, but but maybe that's off topic right now. We can talk about another. Sure. Yeah. You, you. Well, it's 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 really just important to realize that if you're not using the trivium on yourself, then you're you're missing an opportunity. Mm. Mm. So then, like, to, to take it literally, I, I I mean I did it. So, but 
you're you're sitting there you're asking yourself this the question hey what's going on right now what, what am i feeling what, like where does yeah. it come from uh, um and it can't just go back to because they because of them <laughs> you know because they did this mm -hmm. well it, mm -hmm. but why am i feeling it mm -hmm. they are a challenge they're not a villain mm -hmm. i am the creator creating my reality i am not a victim mm -hmm. I'm having this experience because somehow I, I created it through my focus, through my, uh, through my irrational processes. And I need to correct those irrational processes and make them rational. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so you, you mentioned it before, so you discover, okay, that, that like, that's a pattern, pattern or a thought pattern I learned at that specific situation in my childhood. Yeah, mm -hmm. but but from a higher perspective, from or from where I am right now, it it doesn't define me. It, it it it's just something I learned, and so like where I am right now, what what is the truth, or what what is serving me, or what 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 um is that like? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're you're going. Is it not just the truth, but also you want to know what what the old you know what caused it? You know, this childhood experience where mom forgot me, and uh, or I thought mom forgot me, but she was actually stuck in a traffic jam. You know, could have caused it. And now that I look at that, then I say, well, maybe just maybe. And I use words like maybe and stuff like that. So I've, I've learned NLP to talk to myself in my own subconscious so that I can replace um, the old pattern with a new pattern, the old possibility with a new possibility. And I'll get into this a lot more actually in our next podcast. Okay. Where we yeah. talk mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, boundary magic, because I've learned how to change it using boundaries, change my thinking, change my experience using boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so cool. healthy psychological boundaries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Yes. So really, um, just putting this up just so people can know what motivated reasoning is, but it's just confirmation bias taken to the next level. Uh, it's reasoning that leads people to confirm what they already believe while ignoring contrary data. Um, they're, they're basically motivated uh, by emotion. So sometimes it's called emotionally motivated reasoning. And they're being led by emotions. So for example, uh, I have an agenda. I'm a government person. I have an agenda. I want you to start accepting lo loads and loads of um, uh, people from Arab countries and third world countries into your country. So now I, I show boats coming over and now there's, I, I have a pictures of a child on the beach, you know, dead on the beach. Might not even be a real dead child. It just might be a child laying there on the beach. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm going to make you think that it's that. So now you're going to you're motivated, you're, you're using motivated reasoning to justify uh, this action. Okay, well, it's okay if, you know, the government lets all these people in our country because I don't want them dying, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, but, but why? You know, there, there's no why here. It's just, it's, you're just being led around by guilt and by shame and by, you know, the fear of being a bad person and the desire to be a good person. And, and you're not being led by truth. This is not an objectively moral thing it's it's subjectively moral therefore it's um what do they call uh well, it, it, relative morality mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. relative morality is is using you know these these tricks like motivated re reasoning from a conclusion so objective morality reasons from evidence subjective morality reasons from conclusions mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Seems uh, very common. <laughs> yeah, very, very. I mean, it's, it's like, it, it, it's been, it's pathological at this point. I mean, this is just, I mean, it's, 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 society is just made this way now. And it, it didn't used to be made this way. We've been dumbed down systematically for years, but at the same time, psychology made a lot of breakthroughs through like Freud and, and uh, Carl Jung and many others. So, in a way, it's like we, we have more ability to work through these things if we just take this opportunity. But at the same time, society in general has dumbed down. Yeah, I I don't remember where I read that, but some like two two IQ points every decade since the Second World War or something like that. Oof. Yeah, that's, incre that's crazy. Yeah. Next slide, if you can, please. Yes, absolutely. So... The real reason underlying the power gap between the haves and the have-nots is understanding the why. 
And this is from the, the second movie, The Matrix Reloaded. Mark Passio did a discussion where the three video, uh, the three movies, the trilogy is based on the trivium, the what, the why, the how, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Well, this comes from the second movie, which is the logos, understanding, the why. So the Merovingian, he says, uh, beneath our poised appearance, the truth is we are completely out of control. Causality. There is no escaping it. We are forever slaves to it. Our only hope, our only peace is to understand it, to understand the why. Why is what separates us from them and you from me. Why is the only real source of power. Without it, you are powerless. And this is why you come to me. And this is how you come to me, without why, without power. Another link in the chain. So power, you could say, is another word for why and understanding. Those with understanding have power. Those without understanding have no power. So if you understand why you act and behave as you do, now you have power to change things. If you do not understand why you act and behave as you do, you, can't, you have no power to change things. You look at things that are going on in the world. They understand why. You don't. They have a why. You, we don't. Uh, the person who is able to be self-governing and self-responsible, they have a why. They are autonomous. They have personal power. Autonomous people have power. Children have no power because their parents are the power over them until they get to a certain age. But the certain age is not necessarily about age, but that's how long it takes to learn and integrate why and understanding. So you get to autonomy. And once you are autonomous, you leave the house. But most people, when they leave the house, they're not autonomous. They're just going to university now. And the university now tells them what to do. They give them the why. Now you, you go to your boss and your boss gives you. And so you're perpetually taking everybody else's why all throughout life. You are a slave because you have no why. You have no power. But you can start taking back your power by going inside and changing uh, who you are. And, and I, another word for powerlessness is anger. Mm. When somebody feels powerless, they are angry. So anger communicates the message. It's like a, a dashboard. You're driving your car. You see an instrument tell you something on the dashboard of your car. And you know what to do based on that. Well, boom, you feel anger. Anger tells you you are powerless. That means you need to find power somewhere. And if you don't have power, then you go into frustration. And when you go, after you go into frustration for a while, because you're so powerless and it never gets fair, then you go into depression. And if you didn't have depression, you would die. Depression actually is a release valve, a safety release valve from all of your powerlessness. So if you are a chronically depressed person, it's because you have no power. And if you start understanding, asking why questions to go inside to change things about you, then you get your power back. Then your depression goes away. Yeah. <laughs> so much sense. Yeah. And, uh, when you said that, I was also thinking about the way um, we in our society self identify. Yeah. Like we're believing we're this little wheel in a big machine and um, that there's mm -hmm. just this. Uh, so powerless, right? to school, education, university, whatever, uh, take a job for 40 years and then 20 years retirement and then we die. And it's like, oh, this is life. This is normal. Yeah, this is like, yeah. there's no, there's no um, bigger picture. Yeah? <laughs> and, and Well, and, and imagine trying to go against the system. So you're, I'm going to try to change the whole system, right? Well, mm -hmm. boom, what you're doing now is you're trying to, they have this giant Y and they have this giant machine and you're powerless. So you're going to always be depressed and powerless when you're fighting the system because the system, you need to get as many people as possible to believe your way. Well, if you're just working on yourself, you don't need anybody to believe your way. I don't need a single person to believe my way in order to be powerful. I have to believe my way. I have to work through my issues and become powerful and be able to live my life regardless of what the outside world is doing around me. Mm. I can't let the, the COVID stuff you know, run my life. I can't let the government run my life. I can't let other people run my life. I will be powerful when I can run my life in an autonomous way without anybody, you know, telling me what to do. And so I can constantly regain a little more power every day by going inside. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have to have Jesus in your heart. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. 100%. Yeah. You 100%. need the why in your heart. 
Mm-hmm. You can't get to wisdom. You can't get to how unless you have why in your heart. You can't get to heaven without Jesus. You can't get to how without why. <laughs> this is this is my religion. Yeah, it resonates very much. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay, so now we we get to the part of uh, let's actually talk about logic a little bit. So there's different types of logic. There's actually one dimensional logic, and I'm, you can you know, leave, people can pause the video or whatever at this part, but, but really it's monological thinking is thinking that is conducted exclusively within one point of view or frame of reference. It's figuring how, out how much this $67 pair of shoes with a 25% discount will cost me. Learning what signing this contract obliges me to do. It's finding out what Kennedy was elected president or when Kennedy was elected president. A person can think monologically whether or not the question is generally monological though. So who caused, for example, if one considers the question, who caused the civil war only from a northerner's perspective, American civil war, one is thinking monologically about a multi-logical problem. So a multi-logical uh, problem says, well, who caused the civil war? Now you're gonna look at it from the, the North's perspective, but you're also gonna look at it from the South's perspective. The problem is only the North writes the textbooks. <laughs> so now you're only seeing it from one dimension mono logic and this is not i mean this is important with certain areas like math but there's also multiple ways to come to a conclusion with math now the the process to get there is going to be very logical uh but it's a a true answer is a true answer a correct answer is a correct answer if if math doesn't work you can't just fudge it um but You can learn multi-logical thinking, which is going to be the next slide. No, not the next slide. But let's go to the next slide. Yep. Reason, judgment versus opinions. So a reason, judgment is any belief or conclusion reached on the basis of careful thought and reflection. It's distinguished from mere or unreasoned opinion on one hand and from sheer fact on the other. Few people have clear sense of which of their beliefs are based on reasoned judgment and which are based on mere opinion. Moral or ethical questions, for example, are questions requiring reasoned judgment. So when people say you shouldn't judge, no, this is how you should judge. You should judge with reason. Reason is the judge. Jesus is the judge. You have to let Jesus or God judge. How do you let Jesus or God judge? By going inside and finding reason. And then you create a reasoned judgment an opinion though is a belief that is typically open to dispute sheer unreasoned opinion should be distinguished from reason judgment which are beliefs formed on the basis of careful reasoning so when people are forming it giving an opinion it's usually not based in reason it's just some blind thing they're repeating something they their their parents taught them that they heard it in church one day or whatever they don't have they don't have it in their heart their parent their parents you know, they're, they're a monkey repeating a task. They're parrots saying something that they heard on the news over and over and over again. They're not actually thinking through and coming to the conclusion themselves with evidence, with reason. So we, it's important that we, we learn how, when we're formulating our, our logic, that we, are, we learn how to do reason judgment. And that's going to lead us into the next slide. Uh, that, that seems to me another distortion because uh, I mean, I, I at least I heard so often you shouldn't judge, <laughs> you shouldn't judge, yeah, right. But, well, you, you, you uh, should judge. Well, no, Jesus judges. So, who's judging? Reason, mm-hmm. reason is the judge because reason is objective, it's it's more it's moral because it's objective, it's not subjective, it's not just my opinion, my subjective opinion, it's morally. Uh, it, it's objectively true. It's objectively moral. <laughs> now you still have to stay in your lane, but <laughs> staying in your lane is objectively moral. Now, if I go out of my lane to tell you that you're a bad person, I'm being critical of you. I'm no longer being objectively moral. I'm being subjectively moral. Jo- Jesus is no longer judging. 
Now, if you come to me and you judge me, and then because I have a reasoned judgment about that, like I'm able to listen to what you tell me about me. And I'm like, well, first of all, you're telling me things that aren't your business to tell me. You're crossing into my moral obligation. You're trying to tell me how I should live. Boom. Right there, I know, because reason helped me to judge that you were out of your lane. Mm -hmm. You were now in my lane. So from natural law, you're in the wrong. You're being aggressive. Now, of course, we're, we're, we're talking about subjective things here. We're not talking about murder. <laughs> you know, like, say, if I murder somebody and you come to the lane, so you shouldn't do that. It's like, well, I stay out of my lane. Well, I left my lane to murder that person. Yeah. <laughs> right? So and now, quote, karma gets you. Because if I didn't leave my lane to murder somebody, it wouldn't be a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what I, I can be judged because I did that to some, I did it to somebody else. Now somebody can do it to me. Mm. Makes a lot of sense. But we can get more in that in the next one about natural law. Uh, okay. Yeah, sorry. So now we're, in order to make good reason judgments, we need multilogical thinking, not just monological thinking. Most people, when they're most people when they're doing their rationalizing, they're using one-dimensional logic. They're basing on feelings and other things. But really, what they need to do is they need to go from evidence, but also they need to start listening to other points of view. They need to listen with humility because they don't know everything. I don't know everything. I'm certainly not omnipresent. I can't be omnipresent. I have to rely on you know, the process to help me to make sense of life. I have to process information to make sense of life. And I do that through multilogical thinking, which is thinking that enters into, empathetically or sympathetically enters into, considers and reasons within multiple points of view. So, uh, a multilogical problem or a multidimensional problem is a problem that can be analyzed and approached from more than one, often from conflicting points of view or frames of reference. For example, many ecological problems have a variety of dimensions to them, historical, social, economic, biological, chemical, moral, political, etc. A person comfortable thinking about multilogical problems is comfortable thinking within multiple perspectives, and engaging in dialogical and dialectical thinking, and in practicing intellectual empathy and in thinking across disciplines and domains. So I want to know, uh, I, I guess, like everything that's going on with this pandemic, uh, people are very, very, trust science, and you need to believe the science, but it's all monological. It's just one-dimensional logic. They're not listening to any contradictory ever, evidence. They don't want to hear any contradictory evidence. They want centralized evidence. They only want the centralized opinion. And a centralized opinion is not good. You need decentralization. Decentralization of opinions, decentralization of ideas, decentralization of viewpoints. And this viewpoint diversity is going to help us to synthesize the information to discard what's not true and to come to a, a real truth. That's what a multilogical thinker is doing. And in fact, this is what the King Arthur archetype is doing with Excalibur. Excalibur is the multidimensional sword, the sword of truth that is able to go through rock. Why does it go through rock? How can you place it in the rock? Because it is a multidimensional sword. And only the king who has mastered multidimensional logic, multilogical thinking, can pull the sword from the stone. Hmm. Super interesting. <clears throat> and and this, King Arthur is a metaphor for Jesus again, because he is the one taking the sword from the stone. He is the, the sword of truth, the, the sword of reason. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things we talked briefly before we started this conversation, what I mentioned that um, yeah, um, many of those terms or um, uh, labels, yeah, if, like for example, now multilogical thinking. Yeah, yeah. First of all, I've never heard it before, and, and also maybe some of the other uh, words or um, are new to 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 some of the listeners. Um, and just now, when when you talked about multilogical thinking, I. I um, saw myself practicing basically that with my wife. No, it was taking on her 
uh, her, her perspective uh, in an argument, for example, yeah, to, to put myself mm -hmm. in her shoes and, and think through or feel how, how she must be feeling and why she's reacting react, that way she's doing. And, and, and from that perspective, also seeing that it makes perfectly sense. Yeah, she, she's not like, uh, she's, she's, um, she has her reasons to do so. Yeah. Right. yeah she, she has a point there and I have my point. Yeah. And, and neither, uh, and, and, and um, so, when you mentioned yep. logical thinking, it, it seemed to me that this this was what I was doing without really having a, a, a name to it. Right. And, and so then that's also something I, I wanted to to communicate or share with the, uh, the listeners here that those terms, they might sound very abstract or um, maybe even a, a bit frightening or, or like, oh, okay, this is heavy shit or so, but it's actually... Uh, it, it, it enables so much and then uh, 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 and, and uh, um, the the the, the um, hmm. maybe the, the, what it is describing it, it is has, like it is life yeah it, it, it right. has so yeah. much relevance yeah even though the, the term it's very technical multilogical thinking in that case yeah maybe others too and someone who's like listening to this uh, Oh, this sounds boring, but it, it isn't. Yeah, this is life. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Well, because again, this is yeah. this is when you are now getting into, you know, a regular king knows how to think, right? But King Arthur, he knows how to wield Excalibur. He doesn't just have any sword; he has Excalibur, which means he is a multi-logical thinker. To to be the the king of kings, to be you know you and Jesus was called the king of kings. You need the multi-logical, the multi-logical thinking. You need the multi-dimensional sort of truth. Yeah, I, I want one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Claiming mine, no. <laughs> Bring it on. Mega cool, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's awesome. Also, it helps so much to, to, to find the relevance in it. The, the, those those um, uh, 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 images or the, uh, how you're describing it. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. So yeah, this was a, a real breakthrough for me. And I just want to shout out to criticalthinking.org and Richard Paul, who just recently passed away mm. um, in the last few years, uh, and Linda Elder for putting up the criticalthinking.org website and uh, the, the Society for Critical Thinking um, and all the excellent books that they have. They're available on ebook and uh, regular book because they, they changed my life. Um, I was already a really good thinker, a decent thinker before. But I really got into them after I discovered the Trivium. Then I started buying their books and I just poured through them and I started and, and I was already doing the processing with my partner. And uh, so it just took our processing to the next level. Hmm. So I, I really recommend their, uh, their books, um, the website uh, mm -hmm. contributing in some way to uh, their mission because they are one of the, the few places that are just um, True education, true education. Yeah, th thank you for sharing this. We will add this to the show notes so that everybody can. Um, awesome, awesome. Next yeah. slide, please. Yeah. Dialogical thinking and instruction. So here we go. A dialogical thinking or dialogical thinking is about having a dialogue. It's about you and your wife having an argument and having a discussion. And it's not a, uh, a me or you thing. It's a me and you thing. Um, it's about working together in a cl collaborative fashion rather than in a combative fashion. Now, there can be some combatives to it because you're working through an emotional trigger, but the, the ultimate goal is uh, truth winning out and not the ego winning out. So egocentrism is me versus you. Sociocentrism is us versus them. Egocentric thinking is an argument, it's argumentativeness. But you can have collaborative thinking. This is what some people would call unity consciousness. Unity consciousness is not conformity, where one viewpoint controls all other viewpoints. It's where different viewpoints are able to come together and work through and find the truth together. So dialogical thinking is thinking that involves a dialogue or extended exchange between different points of view or frames of reference. Students learn best in dialogical situations and circumstances in which they continually express their views to others and try to fit others' views into their own. So in dialogical instruction, it's, uh, it's instruction that fosters these dialogues. 
Thus, when considering a question, the class brings all re relevant subjects to bear and considers the perspectives of groups whose views are not canvassed in their textbooks. For example, what did King George think of the Declaration of Independence, the Revolutionary War, the Continental Congress, Jefferson, and Washington? Or how would an economist analyze the situation? What about a historian, a psychologist, a geographer? We want to think from these different dis disciplines, different domains, and we're going to to bring them all up in our conversations in our classrooms or in our conversations with each other. You know, well, what would a philosopher say? Well, in a lot of times, you know, Marxism is really big right now. So what would a Marxist say? Well, what, what would a uh, libertarian say? What would a classical liberal say? What would a Republican say? What would a Democrat say? What would a progressive say? So we can look at all the different viewpoints and we can hopefully kind of synthesize that and come to the truth. Synthesize means that you are working through the dialectic. You're working through the, the us versus them to come to the truth. So the me versus you, the us versus them. To find a consensus. Not, not a consensus, not to find the truth. A consensus is not truth. A consensus is, I mean, you can have a lot of people who are emotionally attached to something come to a consensus based on their emotional attachments. And uh, okay, technically, if, if we would have a dialogue or uh, the discussion, it would, it would be about finding the truth. Yes. Um, that, that, that could lead that I, I make a different conclusion than you. It could. It could. But if you were in a collaborative exchange, we're both going to learn things that are going to help us to come to a, a more solid conclusion. Now, mm -hmm. we're, the middle ground between a truth and a lie is still a lie. So a dialogue is not just you know coming to the middle ground. Because if I, if I have more truth, let's say I'm, I'm better at critical thinking, and so I could tell you more, more true about critical thinking and you have less true about critical thinking just because of my experience in it, mm -hmm. in my practice. Um, if I meet you halfway on something, that doesn't mean that it's a truth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That it, it would actually me be moving further into a lie. So it's not about coming to the middle ground. It's about synthesizing and removing all of the, it's like, a, okay, Mm -hmm. you're refining the bronze or the iron so that you can make the sword sharper you have to remove all the impurities and so the dialogue is like the hammer that hammers the metal and and gets it strong but the the, the prerequisite is that we both want to find the truth like yeah. and, and not just win our case in a sense right it has there has to be the minimum standard there mm -hmm. has to be a minimum standard and the minimum standard is that We both want the truth and we both are letting the, the, the process and reason tell us what it is. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and, and, and who's the process and reason? Jesus. So Jesus is the judge. Mm -hmm. Jesus tells us what is true. Logic tells us what is true. The laws of logic, the laws of reason, the, the different um, rules that help us like clarity, precision, um, breadth depth these are all different rules of logic that bring us to more truth if you go to the next slide i think it's going to cover some of this yep. so this is also from criticalthinking.org and it's dialectical thinking and it is integrative so dialectical thinking is a form of dialogical thinking which is thinking within more than one perspective that can that conducted to test the strengths and weaknesses of opposing points of view Court trials and debates are, in a sense, dialectical. When thinking dialectically, reasoners will pit two or more opposing points of view in competition with each other, de developing each by providing support, raising objections, countering those objections, raising further objections, and so on. Dialectical thinking or discussions can be conducted so as to win by defeating the position one disagrees with, using critical insight and support one's own view and pointing out flaws in other views. But this is called 
weak sense critical thinking when you're using dialectical thinking in this way. So a court trial is weak sense critical thinking. But if we, we insert fair-mindedness into the thing, so if we make fair-mindedness a, a prerequisite for our conversation, now we're gonna concede points that don't stand up to critique. We're gonna to try to integrate or incorporate strong points found in other views. And we're gonna use critical insight to develop a fuller and more accurate view. And this is associated with critical thinking in the full or strong sense. So we wanna be strong sense critical thinkers. And to do that, we are going to do, we are gonna be fair-minded and we're gonna concede points that don't stand up. And we're going to incorporate and then integrate strong points. And one question here about dialectic. So I have not been studying it, a little bit reading about it. And um, mm -hmm. so um, from um, what I've been reading or understanding is that, that it's a concept which is very um, much used in our society to kind of um, uh, make, uh, achieve um, a relative improvement to the two positions, but not necessarily an... Um, Right. It is a manipulative absolute, tactic. Absolute um, uh, good. So you, so they can... you have Hegel, Hegel noticed that the world moves in, uh, the philosopher Hegel noticed that mm. the world moves in dialectics. So he called it the uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, or mm. problem, reaction, solution. Right. Marx took that and weaponized it. And he said, he came up with what's called the Marxist dialectic, where you create the problem, you react to the problem and then you insert your own synthesis that you wanted as a solution all along. So that is actually reasoning from a conclusion still. You're still reasoning from in a circular reasoning from emotional attachment to the, uh, an agenda and the end goal. And you're saying this is the synthesis. Let's come up with a problem for it and a, a, a reaction to it. That is definitely not the way we want to go. Um, but if you're actually in a conversation, you're also doing a dialectic, you, you know, especially if you're triggered, you know, you, you're, you and your wife, you have a, an argument about something if, you know, and, you know, one person is emotionally triggered, they're reacting to you as the problem. So you are the thesis, she is the antithesis. And now as you work through it, you come to a synthesis and the synthesis should be the truth. Like maybe you work through a pattern where you are reflecting something to her and she changes her, her thinking and her focus and now everything changes between the two of you. So maybe she sets a boundary and now you have to change how, now you automatically change how you behave because she set that boundary. For example, I'll give you an example about the dishes. So uh, my partner at the time was telling me she wanted me to do the dishes and she was really triggered that I wasn't doing the dishes. So I was the thesis. She was an antithesis, the antithesis. Now we had a conversation and we came to a synthesis and the synthesis was a boundary where I said as the thesis, I'm more than happy to do dishes when we have a dishwasher because we didn't have a dishwasher at the time and she really wanted help with the dishes and I just hate doing dishes without a dishwasher. But I said for an added bonus, I'll not only do dishes with a dishwasher, I will make sure that they, I will always do them with a the dishwasher. You will never touch dishes as long as I am here in this. That is how you use a dialectic in this in a relationship. Yeah, I think there was a bit of a connection problem. Um, oh, yeah, uh, uh, I lost it um, when you just talked about uh, we never do the dishes when we have a dishwasher. Oh no! <laughs> okay, so if we have a, once we get a dishwasher, I'll do the dishes every day. So I was a thesis. Yes, she was an antithesis, and the solution was we get a dishwasher and I'll do the dishes every day. And that was a synthesis. So now I set a boundary. I'm more than happy to do that. She's no longer triggered because I'm doing dishes every day. 
So that's how you can use dialectical thinking uh, in an integrative fashion in your relationships. Next slide, if you'd like, unless you have a question about those dialectics. Um, no, the, yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, just a real uh, irrationality is egocentric, and this is from um, the Miniature Guide to the Human Mind by Richard Paul and Linda Elder of CriticalThinking.org. Mm -hmm. Human ration rationality is fair-minded and self-developing, while irrationality, or egocentrism, is selfish and self-validating. All irrationality presupposes some degree of unconsciousness in order to function self-deceptively. Most rational thought functions consciously. Because irrationality appears to the mind as reasonable, we must develop strategies for disclosing irrational thought. And that's what I've come up with with the unity process. That is a strategy for uh, disclosing rational thought. Mm. So they've basically equated irrationality and egocentrism as the same thing. So when somebody's being irrational, they're being egocentric. When somebody's being rational, they are now uh, more in unity. Because uh, obviously, rationality is able to coexist and work together in a fair-minded way with others. It's unity. So a lot of the, you know, the new age, they're like, oh, I'm just getting out of ego. I don't have thought anymore. Well, what they're doing is they're still egocentric. They're just, you know, they're just trying to do no thought to get out of their rationality. They're not becoming rational. They're just stopping irrational by trying to stop all thought, which in itself is really pretty irrational in itself. So you, you really want just to become a more rational person because then you're more reasonable and you need Jesus in your heart to do that. Jesus being the law of reason, Jesus being understanding and the why. And you need ways to disclose that. You need to fill your triggers and work through those processes, those triggers, so that you can become more and more conscious. And if you're more conscious, you're more rational. If you're less conscious, you're less rational. Yeah, one of the things that I was thinking also, and you have it here written, uh, can you fake compassion? Yeah, fake it till you make it. Yeah, is, is this is this rational? Is this irrational? Um, like it's a, to to start behaving. Well, compassion is a wisdom you... thing. Could you say again? Compassion can be either wise or fallacious or folly. So if somebody is foolish, there's there's foolish compassion and there's wise compassion. That just means what kind of understanding is there? What kind of knowledge and understanding is there? True knowledge and understanding, or is there false knowledge and understanding? If there's false knowledge and understanding, then it's going to be foolish compassion. But that's not necessarily something you you can yourself dis discover or when you're a subject to uh, a, a foolish com compassion. Well, you have to you have to work through in uh, the process again. You have to disclose when you're being irrational. We all think we're being rational until we come up with we we come into contact with other people where we get in arguments with them, you know. And then somebody's being irrational, and maybe both of us. And we have to process that. We have to work through it. We have to come together in a dialogue, and dialectically come to a synthesis. There was this um, study, or it's not even a study, a survey, where they asked in Germany. Um, a certain number of people do you think you, you your driving abilities are above average yeah <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> two thirds or so <laughs> the participants said yes yes yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah well that that's a dunning kruger effect right there you know people are always uh judging themselves more favorably because they don't have um a standard in order to judge themselves by and if they can anchor into that standard, in my case, I've anchored into the, the law of reason, natural law, Jesus. Because I've anchored into that, now I have a standard from which to judge myself. And so when I'm acting as my observer self, using the standard of logocentrism, of the logos and of the trivium, you know, going through the process of knowledge, understanding minus contradictions, working through contradictions to come to wisdom, now I'm going to have you know, uh, I'm going to be able to judge myself fairly. And I'm going to be hard on myself. I'm not hard on myself, but I'm going to be able to correct the areas that need to be corrected. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is not part of the of the conversation today, but I'm already so curious to to hear even more about the unity process. Yeah. Oh, good. We can we can maybe do one on that too. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Next slide. Yep. So. As, as long as we have developed and continue to adhere to the eight intellectual character traits and we'll hold our thinking accountable with the eight intellectual standards of critical thinking, our reasoning is going to be and will remain objective. And so we have these standards and the standards are clarity, accuracy, precision, relevance, depth, breadth, logic, and fairness. And you can, you can see these in some of the uh, critical thinking books by uh, Richard Paul and Linda Elder. And you, you judge your thinking by this, you know, you go through, it's like, well, I'm writing an article. Is my article clear? Is, is uh, it accurate? Is it precise? Is it relevant? Is it relevant? You know, if there's things in there relevant to what I'm actually trying to say, um, is there depth to it? Breadth, do I have other opinions? Do I, do I have other viewpoints? Am I including different domains of, of uh, thinking? Um, is it logical and is it fair? So you're holding your thinking accountable to these standards on a regular basis. And in fact, I, I do this all the time and I hold other people accountable to these standards. So let's say I'm in a conversation with somebody and they, they do say something, I go, um, could you please give me an example and clarify that for me? Or if they say something that doesn't seem relevant, it's like, I'm having a hard time understanding how this is relevant. Can you please explain that? So I'm holding them accountable to these standards objective standards these standards are universal hmm. super good and, and one of like you just said one of the ways to practice is, is to, to for example write down what you're thinking about a certain topic and then to analyze mm-hmm. like how, how you describe your viewpoint or right so like if you're if you're blogging i do this all the time in my blogging and i've had to become a lot more clear because my original blog posts were, were pretty messy you know like if you're um communicating an idea and you can't communicate it in a simple way for people to understand do you really understand it yourself Hmm. and so i ask myself these questions when i'm writing i ask myself these questions when i'm talking to you right now i'm constantly filtering through these questions is what i'm saying clear is people going to understand it is is what i'm saying precise accurate is it relevant to our conversation is it is it deep enough am i am i bringing enough uh breadth into the conversation is it logical does it make sense Am I being fair? These are constantly filtering through me because it's it's become second nature. So it's something you have internalized over. Um, yes, exactly. Over I've integrated of, Jesus like, into yeah. my heart. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> right. So this yeah. I, again, this is what I would say is Jesus. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. These standards, but also I've integrated these character traits, and I would say this is Jesus as well. These character traits are developed over time you know it's become a more humble person you need to know uh, you need experiences first of all that humiliate you to get humility sometimes you need to be humiliated and life will definitely do it to you especially if you're arrogant i was uh, humiliated through my first divorce my my first marriage collapsed in a spectacular fashion and uh i i could pretend i was a victim to the whole thing but i wasn't um I wasn't a villain, that's for sure, but it was a challenge for me to overcome. And I had, to, it humbled me. I realized I didn't know it all. And I, I internalized at that moment. I had to go inside and start working through shit. So that, that humiliated me. It gave me humility so that I could know that I didn't know it all. Courage. You have to have the courage to, to, to listen to viewpoints that aren't necessarily flattering to your own. You have to hear things and, and be able to feel triggers. You have to be able to work through your triggers. And if you can't own your triggers and work through them, and you just have to project them onto others, you're not very courageous. You're actually a coward. Narcissists, for example, are extreme cowards because they have toxic amounts of shame and they cannot handle looking at their shame or feeling shame. They constantly externalize on others. They constantly pick on others. They cannot see themselves as the problem. Everybody else is the problem. They are cowards. Narcissists are the, the biggest cowards and they're the most controlling. So they're the opposite of dominance. Empathy. I need to understand other viewpoints. I need to get viewpoint diversity. I need to hear your perspective, especially if we're in an argument together. Mm-hmm. 
autonomy. I'm going to become autonomous in my thinking, I'm my own unique person. I'm an individual. You know, when Carl Jung talked about the individuation process, he's talking about becoming autonomous. An autonomous person is a sovereign. All these people claim to be sovereign, yet they are not autonomous thinking. They have no autonomous thinking or very little autonomous thinking, very little original thinking. They can't think themselves to their own conclusions. They are given conclusions, and then they, rational, they are given rationalizations for those conclusions. They're not thinking. They're not autonomous. Integrity. To be an integrity means that you're not in what is the opposite of integrity is disintegrity, disintegration. You're disintegrated. You're not an integrated person. You need to integrate and become in unity with yourself, whole. That means your thinking, your feeling, and your acting are in alignment. You're integrated. To be integrated means your integrity means you're, you're walking the talk. You talk it, but you also walk it. Your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are in alignment. Persevere. Things aren't always easy, but you persevere no matter what. You're always moving towards the truth. This is a character trait. You have to develop it. Confidence and reason. The more that you work the process, the more you go through and you use the standards, the more that you begin to trust logic and how it works. You become very confident that it's going to take you where you want to go. You're confident in reason. You're confident logic takes you where you need to go. So instead of going from a conclusion, we can say, you know what? I can get where I want to go this way. And lastly, we have fair-mindedness. To be a fair-minded person means that you're, you know, considering other things. You're listening. <clears throat> Active listening. You're asking questions because you want to know the truth. You're fair-minded enough to know that you don't know it all because you're humble. But you're, you're just saying, like, I'm going to listen to this and I'm going to weigh it using logic. I'm going to let truth decide. I'm going to use the rules of logic and let it decide if, it, uh, and rather than my emotional attachments. I might want a certain outcome, but I'm going to be fair-minded and not let that outcome cloud my judgment. People who are reasoning from a conclusion are absolutely not fair-minded. Mm. 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 So it implies our society is not uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, the society part, basically is conclusion going from a conclusion. Mm. Mm. Agenda, 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 conclusion, conclusion, conclusion. Mm. Anybody who has any contrary opinions, anybody who's in integrity with themselves, they're autonomous, whatever, empathetic, they are all bigots. Well, one of the questions here, and um, I mean, I also want to be uh, um, appreciative of the time, uh, but but th that would be of interest, and we might talk about this now or maybe the next time. In terms of personality or character, um, uh, like, like, is that um, like? Is that something everybody can, like everybody can develop um, those traits, or like does each one of us with a given personality has? It's just a starting point, but it, it like our personality is not what defines us, or like uh, how? Um, yeah, well, well, okay. So I am denotes personality. So you have different par uh, character traits that define your personality. Some people have a very monological personality. So you got monological thinking, monological thinking and monological personality. I am a dad. I am a husband. I am an employee. I am a Republican or a Democrat. They're just so narrow mind. They just only have these few different things that define who they are. They have a monological identity. But if once you get to a point where you're really working on yourself, you're creating a personality gestalt. And this gestalt is like a multi-logical personality. It's a multi-faceted personality so then you can start saying things like i am humble i am courageous i am empathetic i am autonomous i am integrity i am i i'm able to persevere i'm confident in reason i'm fair-minded so now these character traits are becoming a part of your your personality through working and focusing on them you know that this doesn't come natural at first but like i i have a friend 
a, a partner actually, and uh, she's um, very much. She had said that she's not, you know, she wasn't born empathetic, and and she wasn't raised to be empathetic, but she consciously makes a decision um, to ask questions and to try to understand. And uh, she's go, you know, she placed her focus on it, and now she's going out of her way. And I really admire that how she's just, you know, really focused on becoming a more empathetic person, and how she was aware enough and objective enough to see that she wasn't empathetic. She was sympathetic, yes. Mm-hmm. But not necessarily empathetic. And But through focusing, it's integrating into her personality. And now she can add, I am empathetic to her personality gestalt, her, pers- her multifaceted personality. Mm-hmm. So that would mean to me, you can like where you put your focus, that that's what you can develop yep. or discover. So it's, it's like wherever you are in life with your personality, it is just where you are. It doesn't define where you can go or what, like what, what's possible. Right. It's a starting wherever you are. That's just where you're starting from. Mm-hmm. You can make the decision to focus on these things and, and change. Mm-hmm. And also to, you know, develop these standards as well. So you can use these standards to help you develop those traits. Yeah, Next slide. Uh, I will, I will start applying those. <laughs> I'll start right now. Yeah. Good, good. <laughs> um, when I went through my divorce, I read this book called the, the, the power of empathy by Arthur P. Sierra McCauley. And it was a life changer. It was one of the first books I read while going through my divorce. And he says, we don't know enough to make judgments. That statement embodies the heart and soul of empathy. So basically what he's saying is we don't know enough to make judgments. That means you're humble enough. You humble. So at the heart of empathy is humility. So contained within empathy is humility. The core of empathy is understanding and understanding always precedes explanation and the effort to understand. Empathy asks questions and refuses quick answers. I don't know is one of empathy's most powerful statements. From that admission of not having all the answers, empathy starts searching for ways to expand the picture in order to develop a broader understanding. So when I said uh, breadth is one of the, the eight character, not character traits, but standards for critical thinking, you develop a broader understanding through empathy. So intellectual empathy is actually extremely important in critical thinking. So he used an example in the book where he got in trouble as a child and was in the principal's office. And his dad came into the office and didn't go off on the principal, didn't go off on him. He just said, tell me what happened, principal. And then he asked question after question after question. And when he was done asking questions, he decided based on all the information that the school was actually out of line and out of order and that his son did what he had to do and he took the son out and said come on we're going home and he let the principal know exactly what he thought but he didn't he didn't shoot first ask questions later he asked questions asked questions asked questions and then he knew exactly where to aim the gun and where to shoot it wasn't at his son, it was at the principal in this instance. Mm. That's what empathy does. Empathy slows down. It gets more information. It asks questions. It creates breadth. And it's so important. And it was one of the foundational books after I was humbled and humiliated by my divorce. It was one of the first books that I read that really helped me start knowing inside. Makes a lot so of sense, I, no? I call this empathetic reasoning. Mm. We're asking why questions to understand. Mm. I mean, it, empathy is a form of reasoning and we need to start seeing it as such. Mm. I think um, D- David Icke uh, was, was the one who, um, who read it the first that 0.04 percent of what we can witness with our five senses is uh, or it, it, what we can witness in terms of information from what there is in terms of electromagnetic frequency is 0.04 percent so it's, it's so tiny yeah. and then right 
yeah so it, it makes so much sense and uh, we don't really know a lot here yeah. right yeah we just we don't know enough to make these judgments and so there we have to ask lots and lots of questions amen. next slide amen <laughs> <laughs> okay so the last part so you have knowledge understanding and wisdom or grammar logic and rhetoric so rhetoric is the last phase and that is the ability to persuade in regards to the third stage in the trivium it's not just persuading people but you're in many ways you're persuading reality itself through wise and right action because you think feel then act knowledge understanding and wisdom you are now going into right action and you are persuading reality through your actions so that's how rhetoric is uh, connects into action so we can persuade people obviously uh, we can you know like here i'm using a lot of rhetoric this whole time is rhetoric but i've been uh, we started with an ethos an appeal to ethics or building the trust as uh, me as my character and qualifications and experiences we talked about my background we built ethos uh, then there was uh, logos an appeal to logic using evidence facts history context theories etc i've been appealing to logos a lot that's my primary focus. Uh, very little on ethos, but it is necessary. And also pathos, uh, an appeal to emotions, but not necessarily as a replacement for reason, which is a logical fallacy. So when I say I appeal to emotions, I can appeal to guilt, I can appeal to fear, I can appeal to shame, I can appeal to all kinds of emotions to get you to do something. And that's a manipulation tactic used by sophists. Sophists comes from the word Sophia, the Greek word Sophia, which means wisdom, but they had anything but wisdom. It's like an oxymoron. So sophistry is like those people who actually lack wisdom. They don't, they're, they're fools. They're manipulators. They're using mostly pathos. And if they do have appeal to logic, it's rationalizations because they're coming from a conclusion. A sophist comes, starts from the conclusion. Sophia, they start with wisdom and then they go backwards. They're going from wisdom backwards to, to understanding and knowledge. They're reasoning from a conclusion. And they're going to be focusing a lot on appeals to emotion. Uh, they're also going to say, like science says, you know, this scientist, this prominent science scientist said, of course, this prominent scientist could have been paid to get into his prominent position and, you know, could have been a, a yes man. We don't know. But they're, they're founding their things. And now this this famous doctor who is a yes man and a you know Machiavellian and doesn't care who who dies <laughs> uh, but he's famous and therefore listen to him and we're going to appeal to your fear you know grandma could die if you don't do it this way what the doctor says and now we're going to give you some rationalizations so that's kind of using rhetoric in the wrong direction so, but, so all advertisement basically no like, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, propaganda and mm. uh, marketing is a lot of this mm. is rhetoric but what I'm doing and what we've done in this, this conversation here is we've also used ethos logos and pathos um, you know when I tell a story you know about my divorce or I tell you know a story about a, uh, the dishwasher I'm appealing to emotion there I, I'm also appealing to logos, but there is some emotion going on because I need to connect to the emotions of the listeners to make this exciting, to make it alive. Mm -hmm. For just appealing to logos, then it can get very dry. Mm -hmm. But if you know you're you're getting to know me because I'm I'm talking about my qualifications through this whole thing, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm talking about my my experiences and my stories. One that's ethos, but it's also pathos because I'm connecting emotionally. And then also I'm using all this logic and evidence and, and definitions and things like that. That's the logos. So that, that's rhetoric. That's how rhetoric mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. That's wisdom. <clears throat> and if you're using it in your actions, you know, now you are, you know, let, let's combine the three. Uh, I'm thinking it, feeling it and acting upon it. And the, the action part is incorporating into it your feelings and your thinking. And so 
ethos, logos, and pathos is all combined into how you're acting in the world. However you're acting in the world, whether you're acting in a foolish way or a, a truthful way. But a lot of people are so focused in pathos and they're, you know, they have very little thinking and they just have, they feel it, feel it, feel it, then act. Mm. You know, oh, believe all women or Trump is the devil or, you know, whatever it is, is like, they're just melting down in feelings. And those feelings just direct all of their actions. And they have very little thinking going on. They're not appealing to logic in their own mind. <laughs> you know, mm. they're only appealing, appealing emotions in themselves and then they're acting upon them. So they're, they're very foolish in that regard because they are, uh, they're not, their, their action is very, very one dimensional, very, very much uh, out of balance. You, you, there needs to be a healthy balance of ethos, logos, and pathos. Uh, but the framework and the structure is the logos. A lot of head shaking going on. It <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's very intuitive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, yeah, Aristotle is the one that came up with those three categories. Next slide. Yep. So philosophy versus sophistry. Philosophy uses critical thinking and reason judgment to determine the truth of a matter. While sophistry, which is the, um, you know, starting with the, the conclusion, bypasses critical thought and only uses the art of rhetoric to convince others that they are correct. So the art of rhetoric is not rhetoric. Rhetoric is, is you know, going the correct direction. The art of rhetoric is starting from the wrong direction starting from a conclusion, starting from Sophia. So uh, that's why it's sophistry. So philosophy and sophistry have two very different end goals and thus two very different standards with which to weigh an argument. So in short, David Stewart basically said this. He's a philosopher on YouTube. Philosophers seek the truth regardless of who is correct, while sophists seek to win regardless of what is true. I'm a philosopher. I want to know the truth. I don't care who's correct. I just want to know what is correct and why it's correct. But a sophist, they just want to win. It's about winning. Is, is this the same as aristic? That's something I, I've, I've like discovered by accident. Like it, the, uh, um, it uh, was... Um, I, I don't know that word, so I. It, it was, I it, it, it was, um, um, it was, let me just, uh, we can, we can go on. It, 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 I this guy, like, um, basically it was, um, didactic dialectic and aristic uh, the three forms of um like a kind of um like teaching or, or uh, uh, didactic okay didactic and teaching. Then, uh, along the, those lines I, I discovered aristic as basically like just about winning it doesn't matter um uh, like what's what's been discussed so if, if i would say that the sun is uh, like yellow you would prove me it's black if I would say it's black, you would prove me it's yellow. So it, like and by that, so it, it sounded very much like a sophistry. Right. I, I would say that that it was probably connected in some way. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Yes, yes, yes. So Victoria Hammond said this, sophistry are false arguments that masquerade as reason, truths in support of a case. Sophistry which bears the same relation to truth as camouflage do, does to reality is, interestingly, no longer a word in popular usage, perhaps because it has been superseded by terms such as debate. So a lot of times sophists will say, I just want to have the conversation. Is it just reasonable to have the conversation? Let's introduce this into the conversation, right? We need to have a conversation about this. But then it's just always about them, 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 mm. and you're ridiculing anybody that doesn't have the same view. And they're, you know, they're appealing to emotion. They're appealing to ridicule, uh, you know, which is ad hominem. 
they're they're nut picking, they're cherry picking, they're they're just using all the different fallacies in the world, all these different logical fallacies, uh, because they just want the win. They're a false argument that masquerades as reason, truth, and support of a case. So we can see that through this whole pandemic. There's if, if there's a centralized message, which there is, there's no debate, there's no discussion, there's no um, there's no dialogues allowed. If there's no dialogues allowed, there's only one voice, then you can't have true science. You can't have true reason. You can't have true logic. You just have this one-dimensional logic that's being presented to us and told, and then we have to repeat it. We're not thinking ourselves to these conclusions. We're, we're being given these conclusions. We're being given this evidence. And there is no discussion. Anybody who tries to have a discussion is, is demonized. This, this is sophistry, sophistry on a grand scale. Centralization of thought is sophistry because there is one controlling narrative that is allowed to be spoken and everything else is, is not allowed. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's reasoning from a conclusion and it's a conclusion that is centralized. I, I, I love you, the, the background of camouflage because if, if, if you don't know that, that that that's happening no it's, you you you, you you might perceive it as a debate actually no 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 like you they're referring to scientists and the, <laughs> look yeah. at the debate and the parliament <laughs> and um and, and they'll often give two, two sides of a story in a news article or in a, a news presentation um but they won't even give the right two sides they'll just give like an ad they'll give some crazy side so they'll create a straw man for a side so then they're they're representing sides as if it's you know true empathy, but it's not even the real side. They're not presenting my side. They're presenting some fabricated side called a straw man. Mm -hmm. My side has you know a thousand different angles to look at. Their side has one. Their their opponent side has one, and then they're defeating that opponent mm -hmm. that they manufactured. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even getting a say in the discussion. Mm -hmm. It's not a you know they call it a debate, but it's not. And also, like I said earlier, uh, a debate is very um, low level discussion. When you, you get into a, a dialogue or a dialectical discussion that's in the strong sense, you're now introducing fair mindedness and you're having a, a collaborative discussion. And that's very different. Oh, th th thank you for educating us. Now we know yeah. we can discover it. And, uh, uh, we have a few more slides just to really cut quick cover fallacies because that's important. Yep. I think this one is the next. Yeah. Okay, so fallacy comes from the word Latin word valere, and I'm not pronouncing that right. I'm positive, I'm sure of it. Uh, so please forgive me, anybody who knows Latin. Uh, it means to deceive. Fallacies can be either grammatical which is based in the knowledge part of the trivium or logical, which is based in the understanding part of the trivium. Uh, and they are often used by those skilled in the art of rhetoric, Sophia, sophistry, to manipulate people. Such, such manipulators are called sophists. We already discussed that. Next slide. Yep. So grammatical fallacies can alter our reasoning by manipulating the grammar within our premises as our premises informs our reasoning. So we, we get a premise and then we use that to, to reason from. So we get grammar and we reason from that grammar. Well, and we use words and we form sentences based on the meanings and words. So I'm very careful when I use words, I'm very careful with meanings. Um, like I, I, I try to avoid the word desire and I say want instead, because if you look at desire, D means to remove and sire means to it is the same word they use for creation so to desire something means to remove creativity so i i don't I, i'm going to see use the word want instead i want that rather than i desire that because i don't want to remove creativity from that thing i want to actually create what i want so now i'm going to focus on the wanted the things that i want and i'm going to create those things so i'm careful with my grammar and learning the different words uh, like nice comes from the word foolish or idiot. Yeah. <laughs> so an, an idiot, idiot is nice. Um, 
so I, I try to avoid the word nice because nice is idiotic. <laughs> in, in, in German, in German, we have a saying: that "Nice is the little sister of shit." Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, when manipulating people, why use a logical fallacy when you can instead use a grammatical fallacy? Because they're a lot harder to, to spot, um, especially if you don't know the trivium especially if you don't know to get your what in order before you go into your why. So you can, you can know logical fallacies all day long, but if you have horrible grammar and you're getting gamed in the grammar stage, then it's really not, you know, you're still just as deceived as everybody else. Last slide. Here we go. Logical fallacy. So this is from your logical fallacy is a website. A logical fallacy is a flaw in reasoning. Logical fallacies are like tricks or illusions of thought, and they're often very sneakily used by politicians and the media to fool people. Don't be fooled. So their website was designed to help people identify and call out dodgy logic whenever it may raise its ugly and incoherent head. <clears throat> I use National Wiki or Wikipedia for a lot of the fallacies, because um, at least in those areas, Wikipedia is still pure and uh, not uh, not compromised. Rational Wiki as well. Um, I've learned a lot of different logical fallacies. I discovered a lot of fallacies within myself. I stopped, you know, I worked on myself to stop using ridicule or ad hominems. Um, I became very careful and I, I worked through causal fallacies and just a whole slew of different types of fallacies. There's so many different fallacies out there, but as you process your emotional upsets, as you dive deeper into philosophy, you're going to purify your thinking and you're going to remove fallacy by fallacy by fallacy in yourself as you process and work through your emotional upsets. So that's, that's all I have for the trivium. That's all I have for that, unless you have questions for me. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. It was um, enlightening uh, to listen listen to it and um, some of the things I've been thinking about. Many not. Yeah, so it, it was really an expansion of my horizon. So thank you, thank you a lot for taking the time. Uh, I'm just checking. I think it's around two and a half hours already. So so it's... it's uh, really really awesome uh, that's that's massive information massive uh, knowledge what, what what are you sharing here with with uh, with us so thank you thank you so much and i mean one of the things i ask myself now like like i i want to integrate that further and i want, want to understand understand that further what, what what you say is is the the, the logical next step or um if there is one and um like if someone is, is interested or, or, or no, like, okay, that, like it sounds pretty interesting. It sounds also a little bit overwhelming, <laughs> possibly. Yeah, with a lot of information. Yeah, so. Well, well, what I do is the Unity, I use our Unity process in sessions with people. Mm -hmm. So I use a lot of Socratic dialogue. I ask questions. Um, I'm helping them set boundaries, do affirmations, changing their focus, helping them focus on uh, discovering what the old thoughts are and then finding out what the new thoughts should be based on my understanding of natural law, philosophy, objectivity, et cetera. So I'm able to help people to deconstruct their thinking, deconstruct their feeling also, you know, their emotional upsets and problems with, you know, whether it's uh, having problems dating. I, I, help a lot, I help women all the time with dating issues. That's actually something I'm really good at because I can help them upgrade the quality of men in their life through asking them questions and, and working through their traumatic experiences and things like that. I can help men as well uh, to um, change their lives just through, you know, systematically asking them questions and helping them to step up as a man in their family, step up as a man in their relationships, uh, anywhere in their life and to um, become a better thinker and to also to, to become more emotionally intelligent. So, I do the unity process with people. I ask them questions. Um, I've been told that one session uh, equates to about a year's worth of therapy. So when a person does about a year's worth of therapy, that's one session for me. 
I, I'm able to go really deep, really quick through systematically asking these questions. I know exactly what buttons to push and where to find on a, a person when they're coming to me with a problem. Yeah. And uh, it, it's even, I, I can help people, especially when they, it's like if they buy a session package, then we're going to, to really go through one step at a time. And at each, each session is like the next step. So they have a problem come up, we work on it. Then the next week between the session, they have another problem come up and that's what we work on. So we work on things that come into their life just before the session. And we work through it one step at a time in a process oriented way because process is important. Jesus is important. Hmm. It's all about the logos. Working the process one step at a time. So yeah, I work with, with men, I work with women, I can work with couples. Uh, I'm, I'm very much able to, uh, to, to help people deconstruct their thinking and to come to a new way of being in the world. And they're not necessarily going to, you know, be working the trigger, you know, efficiently or stuff, but they are going to be more self-aware and more conscious. And because I'm asking them the questions and because I'm being this person, I'm modeling this behavior for them. I'm modeling the process for them. So it's, 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 it's really uh, taking whatever is happening in your life. Yeah. And, and, and kind of using that as an, as an, um, as, as, as a case yeah, to, to train your thinking and to, to become more child. Yeah. So, uh, I'm acting as their observer. I'm inside the, I'm, I'm in the session. I'm acting as their observer self and they are the one having the experience. And now we are having a dialogue between the observer self and the, the, the experiencing self. So I'm acting as their observer and I'm acting as their observer self. And now the dialogue happens between the two sides. So between the observer and the one experiencing it, and then they can work through that issue. And then the problem is the challenge that they're working through. So the, the villain is usually the challenge, right? So that's the problem that they're dealing with. I'm the coach acting as their observer self. They're the creator who is learning to create a life in a better way. Mm -hmm. Sounds pretty intriguing yeah and uh, uh and um, <laughs> they can visit my web yeah yeah yeah. so um i mean we will add all the information and also you kindly mm -hmm. offer this presentation the slides to be added to the show notes if that's still okay yeah we, we, uh, yes yes of course love to do this and so. my uh website is on most of the slides so <laughs> yes yeah, so, i mean I, I will add all the resources where people can find you know more about you can contact you if they wish to do so so that uh yeah mm -hmm. everybody can can learn more about these so valuable um I don't know, con concepts teachings the truth i, I, I don't know how, yeah how, how to best describe it yeah? but uh it has been has been really enlightening so um uh, really process oriented <laughs> yeah nathan thank you thank you so much and um the best thing is uh if if this uh, uh, is up if we have another conversation scheduled where we uh yeah. you mentioned it before um intentions to talk about natural law and uh, what's, what's yeah and it won't go nearly as long but uh mm -hmm. we'll we'll definitely cover uh we'll, we'll have a great conversation and it'll probably be a lot more conversational on that one too yeah. So, um, yeah, then dear Nathan, yeah. Th thank you. Thank you again. It was incredibly insightful. Um, thank you for educating us. And, um, I, I will ask, will add all the information to the show notes so that everybody can learn about you can, can listen to this again, can, can contact you. And, um, yeah, thank you again for, for, for I appreciate it. Thank and, you. Um, thank yeah. you for having me on your show. For sharing and, your uh, look forward to seeing you uh, next week. Yeah, thank you very much, Nathan. Yeah, speak soon. Take care, Simon.